How you doing, people? Peoples? How are you, peoples? Do I need to wipe down the screen again? All right, folks, before I wipe down the screen, please, first priority, be prayed up. Take a moment to pray, honestly. Take me seriously when I say pray. You need the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. Pray. Spirit, fill us, sanctify us, illuminate us, empower us to know the word, love it, love Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's first priority. Take a moment to pray. Second, share the link on your social media pages. Invite more folks to learn. And please do hit the like button so that when people do a search for something, these videos will come up. And thirdly, once class begins, we ask Holy Spirit to take over even my tongue and be the teacher and we the disciples of the Spirit. And we don't get distracted. No debates in the comment section. No side talks. No socializing. This is class. Okay? Focus. Now my cat wants attention. Hold on, guys. Is the screen good? We ask the Lord Jesus bless the audio-visual qualities to be optimal and the internet connection to be optimal. Screen good because my computer's dirty. No matter how many times I will clean it, it just gets dirty, just like me. Screen is good. It's not blurry. Only the lonely. Poor little flu, flu. Okay, good. All right, then it's just me. I'm paranoid. Poor little flu. Oh, yeah. I was a fool. Oh, I may have to put on the air because it's a little hot on me. Poor little fool in love. Poor little fool. Oh, yeah. I was a fool. Oh, poor little fool in love. Hold on. Poor little fool. Oh, yeah. I was a fool. Uh -huh. Let me put on the air and then we'll pray. All right. We got a lot to cover. Now, this is part one. You know what that means? We're going to take our time prayerfully. We're going to go slow enough that you understand, right? And fast enough not to belabor it. And so we're going to do multiple parts. We want to meditate on the word and focus and understand not rush through it so we can learn the meat of scripture the depth of scripture and i promise if the holy spirit is pleased to show up you're going to learn about the trinity much more deeply and richly about christ being the god man about his work of salvation the human limitations he took on the work of the holy spirit in saving us and illuminating us so you're going to learn a lot about the core doctrines of the faith by the grace of the spirit working through human vessels and i pray i'm one of them for the glory of jesus christ okay so let's begin in the, the lord's prayer in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. You'll also learn the science of biblical interpretation, what they call hermeneutics. Now, if you guys have been following me, you know I have a lisp and I stutter. So there are certain words that make me stutter like it's going out of style. And then I start salivating. Fuckerent, fuckatash. Hermeneutics is one of them. The science and art of biblical interpretation. So you're going to learn how to properly interpret scripture. Okay? You're going to learn the proper way of interpreting scripture, how not to interpret it, and a whole host of issues by the grace of God. So very important. So... Pray up. We ask the Holy Spirit to fill us and guide us. We ask the Holy Spirit to feed us the holy flesh of Jesus Christ and give us the blood of Jesus Christ and grant our loved ones, grant my daughters, even their mother, the flesh of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ for their and our salvation, our healing, our wholeness, our redemption, our purification, cleansing, <clears throat> our deliverance, and for our food, because the Lord Jesus says his flesh is true food and his blood is true drink. And may the Holy Spirit 
enable and empower us to despise Satan with perfect hatred, to despise the world, the lust of the world, to despise our sinful flesh and our lusts, and to give us the power to overcome our flesh, crucify our flesh, resist Satan, submit to the Lord Jesus with perfect submission. May the Holy Spirit save us from laziness and idleness and weakness and timidity and fear and compromise. And may the Holy Spirit, the eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son, our God, our Lord, our life, our love, our Savior, Redeemer, Creator, Sustainer, Preserver, Life Giver, our Maker, control our tongues, control our mouths, control the words of our tongues, guard our mouths and our tongues to never allow, ever allow a wicked, evil, filthy, blasphemous, idolatrous word to come out of our tongues, our mouths, whether voluntarily or even accidentally, and never allow us to betray or deny or dishonor or blaspheme or disown Jesus Christ. May the Holy Spirit give us such power to face all things for Jesus, whether it's homelessness, whether it's persecution, slander, attack, imprisonment, torture, even death. May give us the power to love Jesus Christ more than our pleasures, more than this life in this world, because Jesus is true life and he's truly our life. And may the Holy Spirit save us from error and stammering and confusion. <laughs> save me from stuttering. Save, save us from misinterpretation, misapplication, from distorting scripture. May the Holy Spirit grant our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our ears illumination to know the word he inspired, to live out that word, to be empowered by the word, transformed by the word, to recall that word perfectly, recite that word perfectly, Love that word perfectly. Obey it perfectly. Proclaim it perfectly without shame, without compromise. For the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. May he sanctify our motives to never prostitute ourselves for fame, for fortune, for status and money. May the Holy Spirit never allow us to fall into any scandal, whether financial or sexual, to never bring shame to the Lord Jesus so that the enemies of the cross will never mock and ridicule our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who forever lives and cannot fail. May the Holy Spirit fill my throat, my lungs, my chest, my heart, my arteries with perfect health, strength, and vigor, and grant me perfect self-control, self-discipline to stay healthy for the glory of the Lord Jesus, for the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that my health will never be used by Saint to me, and I can serve you fully. And may the Holy Spirit <clears throat> strengthen my voice, fill it with passion to magnify Jesus Christ and bless you, his servants as he uses me for the glory of Jesus Christ. And to recall scripture, interpret scripture perfectly. In Jesus' name, we ask this, Holy Spirit. You are the perfect teacher. And give us the power to perfectly trust you, to trust in you, to cling to you, to cleave to you, to perfectly hope in you and live for you and love you, Holy Spirit. And I pray you save our loved ones. Save my daughter. Save their mother. Have mercy on their mother. Please. She's broken and hurt and damaged. And she needs healing. I need healing. We all need healing. And forgive us, Holy Spirit, when even among those who profess to be Christian, we attack each other. Save me from sinning against you in my anger. And save me from the slanders of those who profess to be brethren, but are false brethren who think they're doing you a service. And I pray you remove the beams from our eyes. So I don't think I am anything special or God's gift to the church. I am not. You are the gift of the Father and Son to the church. And we trust in you. In Jesus' name, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. El Rafa, El Rafa, El Rafa. Beatify us with the beauty of Jesus Christ, the holiness of Jesus Christ. And keep the internet connection strong for the glory of Jesus. In Jesus' name, El Rafa, El Rafa, El Rafa, Father, Son, Spirit. Guys, pray I'm not too loud, man. Pray I don't lose my voice and I don't distract my ears. Are you sure the quality is good? There are a few things I want to touch upon as we get into it. Now, remember, this is part one. I may do three, four, five parts in a series. And Lord willing... We'll now do another part on my series and the Lord's Prayer and the Nicene Creed. And on and on it goes, provided you ask the Lord for miraculous protection on my life and on my daughter's life. And I don't fall and shame Jesus, fall into any slander or scandal. And the Lord gives me the health and holiness to glorify him until he summons me and the provision to do this work in Jesus' name. Well, Sergeant Gridge, thank you, brother. Today's my cheat day. I try to reward myself by a cheat day. But I can tell you, on that cheat day, when I start just eating, like, say, ice cream, whatever, I get sick. So though it's my cheat day, I get sick. I feel a little sick because my body's used to trying to eat very tight and as healthy as I can. So pray for me. A little sluggish today. So me and Sergeant Grinch, we try to do a lot of walking. 
So Lord willing, I'll try to do that today. So bless you all. Pray for one another. Love one another in your deeds, not just lip service. And pray for those who are sick among us, right? Hey, Miriam, what you take? What's up, sister? Are you noticing that I'm getting more tone? What's up, girlfriend? I don't even hit weights. I have yet to go to the gym and start lifting weights because I hate weightlifting. I hate weights. I used to love it. I need to to get tone, right? Sadly, because I did lose weight fast by the mercy of Jesus, and I pray I keep it off by the power of the Holy Spirit. I got a lot of, sorry, I don't want to discuss you, loose skin, so I got to tighten it up somehow, right? Well, what's up, girlfriend? Why are you taking, why are you noticing me, girl? I'm old enough to be your daddy, girl. Mini a butch, they say in a Syrian. All right, just want to talk about a few things as we begin. So don't rush me and don't be impatient. Yeah, I have love handles. Nobody loves to have a handle. What's up, Sheikh Umad? Mini a butch. I heard that Christian Prince did something similar today. Showed from the Quran, showed from the Quran that uh, Jesus knows all things. By the way, Pray for DJ Nex and his lovely wife. DJ Nex is a Christian brother who loves Jesus, who's also a DJ. And I met him several years ago, and God has been taking him on a journey. He and his wife have returned to the Catholic Church. And this Easter, they will be <clears throat> engrafted into the Catholic Church. This Easter. Lord willing, I pray to attend. So pray for him and his wife, right? The Lord is doing something marvelous and wondrous in this man's life and his wife. And may the Lord bless them with the desires of their heart, right? So now, in light of that, here's another praise report. Yep, he's going to be confirmed on Easter vigil. Yeah, baby. All right, now, another praise report. This is why <laughs> the Calvinists are upset and... Uh, Others are upset and they want to now just smear me and attack my character for my character flaws instead of refuting the facts because they can't do it, right? I just got this today. I won't mention the name, okay? Guys, I just got this today. I won't mention the name. Someone sent me this on Skype. Now watch this. Yeah. Watch this, guys. Yes, right, Sarah. Sarah, there you go, girlfriend. You know it. That you go, girlfriend. You sound like an apologist. You apologizing, girlfriend. They're always upset. It's predestined. <laughs> All right. Here's another praise report. I got this today, about two hours ago. Hey, Sam. May the Lord bless you. I pray he blesses all of us, and I need a blessing. My daughters need a blessing. Their mother needs a blessing. Pray for their mother. She's broken. She is. She really is. I may not articulate it enough. She's a broken vessel, and she lives in constant pain and misery, and she needs to truly experience Jesus in a miraculous way and be flooded in his love because she hasn't gotten to that point yet. Because if she did, she'd be content in Jesus. So pray for her. It breaks my heart. Constant life of pain and misery. Anyway, may the Lord bless you. I understand. I understand. Watch here. You are busy with stuff and may not have time to respond. I wanted to let you know that for a while now, I've been trying to avoid listening to anything from Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. Whenever I heard a sound refutation to Protestantism, notice a sound, he knew the argument of sound. From them, I would quickly turn to another video siding with Protestants. And I can assuredly say right now in this message that I no longer count Catholic and Orthodox as non-Christian, but now see them as brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord that I've come across your channel and Williams as well. I am still wrestling with relearning the Bible. Thank you, brother in the Lord Jesus, and may you continue in boldness. He's where I was 10 years ago, over 10 years ago. When I finally came to grips with reality, Catholics and Orthodox are not heretics, that they are true believers born of the Spirit. That's the first step. So there you go. Now, with that said, I just want to remind you guys of knowing our limitations and staying in our lane. Know the areas that God has gifted you. Know the areas that God has called you to excel in. Know your limitations and defer to other brothers and sisters, members of the spiritual body, who have been gifted in those areas that you have not been gifted. 
Okay, now let me explain what I mean. I have said it and I'll say it again. I am not gifted to deal with atheists or macroevolutionists. That's not my area because I rarely ran into atheists, rarely ran into those who tried to destroy intelligent design or creationism due to the theory of evolution. And I'm talking about macroevolution, not variations within species, right? Adaptations within species. I'm not talking about that. That's what we call microevolution, even though they say that's an out dated way of speaking. That's not my area. So when people tell me, aren't you to be atheist? Because that's not my area. I know God exists. I know Jesus is alive. I know the Bible is supernatural. I don't need to be convinced. And I don't need scientific proofs to convince me. The very fact that creation exists, I exist, you exist, complexity of life all around us, that in itself is proof God exists. Only the fool will look at that and try to suppress that revelation to deny the existence of God. So I don't need to be convinced God exists. I know it. Now, the problem is, the problem is, there are those that need more sophisticated, complex arguments from science and philosophy. And that's not my forte. So I defer people to the experts. Jay Dyer is a beast in destroying atheism. He truly is. Right? Ken Hoven is a nightmare in destroying macroevolutionists. He is a nightmare. You have now Matt Powell, who is humiliating atheists. And those who believe in macroevolution, showing what a joke it is that you believe that you evolved from cosmic soup, that you evolved from a rock. When they break it down and show you what they really believe, you see how stupid it is. And like, how in the world can anyone believe this? But those are their areas. And then you have others like Jason Lyle. These are young earth creationists. And then you have the old earth creationists like you, Ross. Their specialty is to destroy atheism and show it's foolish. It's irrational and why macroevolution is not supported by the facts of science. And a beast in that area, another beast who's a nightmare to macroevolutionists is Robert Syngenis. Robert Syngenis is underrated, sadly. He is probably one of the sharpest and most knowledgeable experts in the field of atheism and macroevolution. He has studied science so in-depth. He's a genius. And when he does debate atheists, he makes them sound like they're kindergarten students. God has gifted them in those areas. I defer to them. Okay? I defer to them. Go to them. Once you know that your gifting is in this area, not this, be humble and ask the Lord to grant you the grace to be humble and teachable. Stay in your lane and defer to the experts. The problem becomes when we try to be an expert in every field and then we end up embarrassing ourselves, exposing ourselves, and humiliating ourselves. Part of the beef that started, part of the beef between Anthony Rogers and us is that Anthony tried to then venture into patristics and pretended that he knows the fathers. He got humiliated. He got exposed. He got shamed. He's now been discredited. So he's now manifesting instead of being humble and swallowing his pride and repenting. And I'm not taking this to mention him, but that's an example of someone who, because he has a vendetta against the Catholic Church and against me leaving Calvinism, he now is trying to pretend something he's not. An expert at patristics, and he got humiliated badly by Kai, Perry Robinson, and by William Albright, and it's going to get much worse. But it's I'm not mentioning him. That's not the focus. The focus is now on another person who is an expert on destroying macroevolution. He's amazing. He is an atheist nightmare, and he's now regularly debating those who think they are knowledge and love to prove from science the theory of macroevolution and refute his arguments against macroevolution. Ken Hoven, he's amazing. He, I love his work. He's amazing. The problem with Ken Hoven is that he then ventures into areas that are not his calling and expertise. And then he does some damage. So I want to play some clips. As a reminder, do pray for one another. Pray for me.
Here's what I want you guys to pray for. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what your giftings are and operate in those gifts and know your limits and don't venture into areas that the Spirit has not called you or gifted you in. And ask the Spirit to do that with me, to destroy my pride and arrogance, to remain humble and not to have fake piety. So I want to just play some clips on his statements concerning the Trinity. So I want to use this as a teaching moment. Remember, this is just part one. We got a lot to unpack. This is just some things I need to say before we begin as Holy Spirit leads. And then also lay the foundation. And Lord willing, by the time we finish the series, I promise you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, trusting in the Spirit and His goodness and His love for the church, I promise you, you will know how to destroy and decimate this objection every time someone raises it. Even though I've already answered it on my channel dozens of times and I've written several articles still. So I'm going to play some clips. What I want you to do is take a moment to look in the description box. I have linked to several articles related to this topic and the issue of Ken Hovind. But I want to play some clips. Right? Play some cl clips. Here is the first clip. This comes from Kent Hovind Official. That's his YouTube channel. Aired on June 28, 2019. He's doing a Bible study in 1 Timothy 3. Dr. Kent Hovind Bible study, right, on 1 Timothy 3. Right? So we're going to start at the 15 minute 37 second mark. Watch this. He's talking about the King James Version reading where it says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And then using that to speak about the Trinity. Now watch. Let's go there. Listen. Soul and with all thy might. Deuteronomy chapter 6. There's only one God. Listen. But he presents himself to us in three different ways. There are hundreds of illustrations. I'll give you some in a minute. I am a father. I'm also a son. I'm also a brother. I'm only one person, but I have three very distinct roles. That's one analogy. Did you catch that? You see the analogy he gave? That's modalism. You see? That's what happens when you venture into areas that are not your client. He's a Trinitarian, by the way. He's a Trinitarian. Now, don't misunderstand him. He affirms the Trinity, three eternal persons. It's not his gifting and his calling to discuss this issue well true jesus he doesn't think catholicism is true but i just heard him say there are catholics who are born of the spirit born again or brothers and sisters in the lord jesus christ he thinks the catholic church has a lot of false teaching but i just listened to one of his sessions just what a couple days ago he said no there are catholics who are born again who are brothers and sisters in the lord jesus christ though he believes that the catholic church has some false teaching but he believes that about calvinism and you know, evangelicalism. He even did an interview with Robert Sengenis. So he doesn't think Catholics are outright apostate heretics. He believes there are true believers born of the spirit who go to the Catholic church, but he believes that the Catholic church has some false teaching. And he thinks that about basically every other denomination except his own because he only has, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, let me play this other clip. Now we're going to go to the 22 minute, 50 second mark. 22 minute, 50 second mark. And there's a story related to why I'm playing these clips. Because I sent him some articles to upload to his website, which he never did. Years ago, when he first came out of prison. So 22 minute, 50 second mark. Listen. To their car, you know. Yep. Someone's asking him a question. He's asking him about the Holy Ghost. Where was the Holy Ghost before Jesus sent him? Because you can't hear the question. Where was the Holy Ghost before Jesus sent him? Listen. Well, the Holy Ghost would be eternal. He would be a part of the Godhead. Jesus said, I'm going to leave and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. So when you pray and invite Jesus into your heart, technically it's the Holy Spirit coming in. Jesus was Before Jesus spirit. is saying now, where they're it? all eternal. They're all this, they're one person. I say, did you hear that? They're all eternal. They're all one person. Let me play that again. Listen, they're all eternal. They're all one person. Listen, all they're all this, they're one person. I say they, uh, God. Jesus Listen, was the Holy spirit. they're all eternal. They're all this, they're one person. I say they. Uh, okay, all one person. Now, if you just stop there, you're going to think he's a modalist. He's not. He believes in the Trinity. They're all eternal. They're all one person. 
But now let me let him finish his point. So we're going to listen to several more minutes. Listen. Uh, God is one, but he shows himself somehow in three different ways, Father, Son, Spirit. I'll give you some examples that may help unwind listen. this a little bit, okay? Go and preach the gospel, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. All right, look at this mistake. Now, some people argue you should only baptize in the name of Jesus because of another verse that says baptize in the name of Jesus. No, actually, the people who tell you to baptize in the name of Jesus only are modalists, heretics, oneness heretics who think that there's only one person who assumes different roles and appears in different modes, and it's the Father who manifests as the human Jesus and then will appear as the Holy Spirit. And because the, the Father is none other than Jesus in a human mode, that Jesus is the human mode of the Father. So the Father's name is Jesus. And if the Father is the Son in his human mode manifestation, then that manifestation, that human mode of the Father is Jesus. And when the Father then manifests in a different mode as a spirit, that's Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's why they baptize in Jesus' name only. But now listen to what he's going to say. When I baptize people, I say, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and dunk them under the water and pull them back out. I don't think it's worth arguing or splitting a church over. By what authority can Kent Hovind baptize anyone? Now, brethren, don't misunderstand me when I say this. I've been grieving and hurting over this man. He's a great, great man. Like me, and I'm being honest, like me, I don't say this to be humble. Please hear my heart because I'm preparing you. I want you to learn from our mistakes. And I try to be as transparent as I can so that people don't make me more than I am because our hearts are idol factories, that I'm damaged. And I mean it when I say like me. I have issues. I'm very impatient. I get angry. And sometimes my anger gets the best of me and I start cussing like a sailor. I, I'm honest. I, I do. I cuss people out when I get angry, F-bombs and B-I-H and, you know, pussy willow. You know, I'm being honest. I'm not going to lie. Not because I'm trying to be a hero or because I need healing. I really do. And if the Holy Spirit lets me go <clears throat> and releases me from his sovereign arms and gives me what I deserve, man, I am dangerous. So... You will notice now every apologist has serious issues. Have you seen it now? Have you now seen enough proof for what I've been saying for years? If not, look at Anthony Rogers' recent manifestation where he started <clears throat> manifesting <clears throat> as a demon, right? Mocking Assyrians, mocking me, slandering me misrepresenting the facts of my situation with my ex-wife and children. If you wanted proof that we're all sick and damaged, and if God gives us what I, we deserve, notice for all this time, people thought that Anthony was a sweet, gentle Christian and a humble soul. You saw that was a lie. You now saw his true colors. He's a wicked, filthy, nasty slander. He's vile, right? Thank God it came out. You know why? So that those who make him an idol will be shamed and convicted and humiliated to repent of the idolatry. The reason why I say, what authority does this man have to baptize? He's not qualified, you know, he's not validly ordained as a minister to run a church. He doesn't go to church. He lives on his piece of property called, <clears throat> what is it called? Uh, you guys know the name? It's it's a it's like a camp ground where people live there. Anyway, it's pretty much he runs the church. And I say that because the man is seriously damaged because now, and this is public record. I'm not slandering him. If it wasn't public, I wouldn't mention it. He's now on wife number four. He's been married four times. Dinosaur Adventureland. He lives on a camp park campground called Dinosaur Adventureland, right? And now he's on wife number four. The first three wives left him. And the third wife is now going around on atheist channels and other Christian channels who hate Kent Hovind and allowing her 
to slander him and give her side of the story in order to discredit his work. You see the problem? A man who has been destroying macroevolution, who's been eating up atheists in debates, who has been doing such wonderful work for over 30 years, over 30 years in destroying Satan's lie of macroevolution. And now Satan found a way of discrediting him in the eyes of people. And I'm not saying he's innocent because he can't control his sexual urges. He right away rushes to get married instead of asking the Holy Spirit to give him the power to mortify his sinful lust and control himself and wrestle with his lusts. When one wife leaves, automatically he gets married to someone else. And he justifies it by misinterpreting 1 Corinthians 7, 12 to 16. So here's a man who is amazingly gifted to destroy macroevolution and is an atheist nightmare. But because of his certain psychological, emotional scars and his need for sexual intimacy has allowed himself to be attacked and discredited and also pontificates on areas that he should be silent on. It's, it's heartbreaking. So that's why I say, by what authority does he have to say he baptizes and that whether you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or in the name of Jesus, it doesn't matter. Why? Because you say so? You say so? Now listen. Because both are mentioned. You can do it however you want. Okay, but don't do it, take Who told you that? Who told Ken Hovind you can do it however you want? His own interpretation of Scripture? See, this is where it gets dangerous, right? Now, because you do it one way and somebody else does it another way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, but to listen. us... There is but one God, the Father, of whom all are of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Difficult verse to understand, but it's, it's teaching again the Trinity. Jesus is God. First second Corinthians chapter five. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Yeah, How do you get in Christ? The reason I'm letting him say, because you'll see he is a Trinitarian. Don't misconstrue the mistakes and the slips of his tongue. He's a Trinitarian. He believes there are three persons, one God. He's not an expert or qualified in this area, but he still decides to chime in and pontificate nonetheless. Because here you're going to see him affirm the Trinity. Listen. We are, there is one God, the Father, and we are in him. So are we in the Father or are we in Christ? Both. Because Jesus is God. Second Corinthians chapter 13. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. All three in one verse. Okay. Second Corinthians. Colossians chapter 2. In him, talking about Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So God took on a body. Jesus Christ. Hmm. Isaiah chapter 9, it was Almost prophesied, done. for unto us a child is born. Here's where, again, if you don't listen to him in context and you don't hear him out in context, you're going to think he's a modalist because notice what he says. Here's where if you just take snippets and don't be fair and listen to him and all he has to say, you're going to either misunderstand or misrepresent him. Unto us a son is given, talking about Jesus. This is 600 years before Christ. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Jews have always wondered, what does this mean? How can the Everlasting Father become a son? Yeah, I think just to prove he can do anything. See? The Everlasting Father See? became this child and a son. See, so that emphasis of everlasting father will give a weapon to Modus into thinking that he, like them, thinks that Jesus is God the Father. Because of the emphasis, the Father becomes the Son, just to show he can do anything. You see the problem? Son. A son is given. That's what it says. Ask a Jew to explain that one. Who is this talking about here? Isaiah 44, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, 
and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Now listen. So we don't worship three gods. We worship one God in three persons. There's the Trinity. There's not three gods. There's one God who somehow reveals himself to us in three different persons. See, Trinity. See, he's a Trinitarian. Did you catch it? He's a Trinitarian. You see the point? He's not a modalist. He's not a heretic. He worships and loves the triune God. But because he hasn't spent time studying the Trinity in any great depth, because, again, what is his gifting? What is his calling? To destroy atheism and macro-evolution. And he's a master at it. He is one of the best. Don't let some of these Christian haters try to discount him. I think it's out of envy that they do so. Okay? It's just that this is not his gifting. This is not his area. And he decides to chime in on areas that he should be silent on, like how to baptize, who can baptize. And he does that with other doctrines, which he's not qualified to do so. Okay? But here's an example of another man used mightily by God, but because of his serious issues, his psychological issues like we all have, like Anthony just manifested like a demon, like he has. And this is how God chooses to work. He chooses to work through broken vessels, vessels that are damaged, vessels that struggle with sin and temptation, vessels that need the Holy Spirit to constrain them by his infinite power and never let them go. Otherwise, they're going to do great damage and bring great shame, right? So are you seeing what I've been telling you for years? Number one, don't make any of us more than we are. You're not our followers. Number two, we will sadly disappoint you and break your hearts if you do. Number three, I do not know of an apologist, and I'm including myself, who doesn't have serious issues on an emotional, psychological, spiritual level. And if you had any doubts about that, who would have thought Anthony Rogers would manifest like this wicked, filthy, vile, slanderous demon? Which he is. Do you have thought about that a year ago? Because it was a facade. He was putting on a show. This is why I try to be as transparent with all of you. I try to be honest with you as much as I can. I do because I want you to see the real me so you don't make me more than I am and know that if God gives me what I deserve, I will end up destroying myself. Okay? And that I need your prayers because I need the Spirit to constrain me. Now, one more clip from him. These are a few issues that I need to bring up. One more clip from him. This comes from January 27, 2016. And you'll see why it's related in a minute. You're, it's not, I'm not just doing it to do it. You'll see why it's related in a minute because some of the articles that I linked to were because of Ken Hoven. Some of the articles in the description box were because of Ken Hoven. Now, this comes from January 27, 2016. Kent Hoven official. Dr. Kent Hoven Q&A. Trinity, remarriage, Joe's witnesses, salvation, kinds, flat earth, etc. Five minute, 35 second mark. Five minute, 35 second mark. So let's start. Listen to what he says. For the question. Uh, but here's one from Eric who writes in. I'm so glad to see you're doing well. You've been my hero for a long time. Here recently I ran across a group that's called Biblical Unitarian that deny the Trinity and state it's not needed to explain the existence of God. Now, he answers questions that are sent to him on email. He had someone working for him. Now remember, this is 2016. Hannah, who left him, she too has turned against him. And a wolf in sheep's clothing used to work for him named Theodore, Theo. He too turned against Ken Hovind viciously, has a YouTube channel attacking him. And sadly, some of the accusations are due to Ken Hovind's fault. He asked for it because he's not guarding himself. But what makes Theodore a snake? He's an anti-Trinitarian. I actually talked to Theodore and went after him, not for exposing <clears throat> Ken, but because on his YouTube channel, not only does he attack Kent, but he attacks the Trinity as pagan. So this guy turned out to be a wolf in sheep's clothing all along, an anti-Trinitarian. So this young lady named Hannah used to field the questions and tell Kent, here's a list of questions and answer them. She's since left and she's now spoken against them. It's happening more often than one would like. Now, this is a question from someone asking him, look, I've been reading this website, Biblical Unitarian. That's the website that quotes 
Anthony Buzzard and Carlos Xavier and others. And this man that's asking Kent for help, help me with the Trinity because their arguments seem persuasive and he's about to apostatize and leave his belief in the Trinity. Look how Ken Oven answers it. Well, many groups deny the Trinity. I understand that. And as I said, for the last question, I don't claim to understand it all. I, I do want to understand it. I try it. <laughs> But I, I believe it. I trust it. I think we'll get to heaven for a few minutes and we're going to say, oh, wow, that makes sense. There are many illustrations, all of which Look fall at short at some point. But I am one person, but I am a father, a son, and a brother, and a husband, and a grandpa. How can one person do all that? I am one person, okay? I have a See body. I, 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 am a, I am a spirit that lives in a body. I have a soul. See that analogy it's only again? one of me. Did you see that analogy again? Now, he's a Trinitarian, guys. Don't slander him. He is a Trinitarian. One God and three eternal persons, three eternal different persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. But look how he articulates it. So in my mind, I can think about things, but I can also think about what I'm thinking about. Hmm, is that two separate functions of one mind? I can also have subconscious things that are going on, regulating heartbeat, body temperature that I have no control over at all. So is that just one brain with three very distinct functions? That's another illustration that kind of falls apart at some point but it helps understand okay um listen they deny the trinity and state that it's not needed to explain let's see i find them to be very convincing and biblical i was wondering if you could give us a fair biblical input i might be asking you're not i find them very biblical and convincing so the man is crying out for help i've been reading the site i find them very biblical convincing can you give us any biblical insight? in other words the man thinks ken hoven because he's an expert in destroying atheism, macro-evolution, must surely be an expert on the Trinity. Help me, because I'm about to turn my back on the Trinity. In a lot, but you are a man who stands up for truth. See? Thanks for your time, and would be very grateful to hear your opinion, who God is. Very, I find them to be very convincing and biblical. I was wondering if See? you could give us a fair biblical input. I might be asking a lot. One more time. But you are a man who stands up for truth. Thanks for your time, and would be very grateful to hear your opinion, who God is very understand. Okay, listen. Um, one more time. They deny the Trinity and state that it's not needed to explain. Let's see. I find them to be very convincing and biblical. I was wondering if you could give us a fair biblical input. I might be asking a lot, but you are a man who stands up for truth. Thanks for your time, and would be very grateful to hear your opinion. Who God is very important to my Christian foundation. Yes, I agree. It's very important to the Christian foundation. Jesus was God Himself come in the flesh. How does okay. that answer the question? Uh, here's one from you stood us up that's it and that's it he just moved on that was it he moved on that was it you think that convinced the man when he said jesus is god in the flesh when he just said i've been reading the website biblical unitarian and i find their responses biblical and convincing and this was in 2016 so what i did was if you go to my description box i had contact him i spoke to him on the phone and i said to him if I write out articles for you to upload to your website, at that time it was 2peter3.com or drdino.com on the Trinity, and I'll prove the Trinity from the King James Bible. Would you upload them? He goes, sure, send them to me. So I wrote them out, I sent it to him, and I talked to him, and he was telling me he was reading them. This was back then, and he never uploaded them or downloaded them. So I uploaded them to my <clears throat> blog recently. So here are the articles that I wrote for Kent Hoven, helping him prove the Trinity from the King James Bible because he only follows the King James Bible. If you look at the description box, you'll see the last three links. The last three links were those materials I wrote for him as a favor to help him because I know this is not his area. All he had to do was mention them and upload them to his site. Never did it. Never did it. So here you go. The Biblical Witness to the Deity of Christ, Part 1 and Part 2. It's there in the description box. And then, if you look at the last thing, Biblical Witness to the Deity of the Holy Spirit. So, folks, I tried to do my part in helping him. But what can he do beyond that? Because he has a huge influence. At least he did back then, before the scandals. So now, you guys, why do I tell you, seek the face of the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the discipline, self-control, to perfectly understand, absorb what you see and hear and read. Take my materials, upload them, translate them, eclipse out of them. 
absorb them, make them part of your spiritual DNA, and then you share them through your own unique way because God has gifted us all uniquely and differently. Don't be a pair to me. The Lord didn't make you to be Sam Shamoon. He made you to be like Jesus. But I'm doing my part in providing the materials to save you the time and the money so you can then magnify the Lord. Many of you are doing it. Like my vaccine is Jesus. He's constantly uploading YouTube sessions refuting modalism and Joe's witnesses, right? And then you have Shamoonian Clips who takes snippets of my larger sessions, highlights specific points, and <clears throat> uploads them in order to allow people who may not have time to go through entire session to get highlights of certain things that I've said that he believes will be impacting. Support these brothers. Pray for these brothers. Subscribe to their channel. Hit like. And you have a lot of people like Ann Chung. Her site devoted to showing the archaeological historical facts supporting the historicity and accuracy of the Bible. And she too uploads Christian princes sessions and mine. Chloe Wakett and others. Too many of you to name. You know who you are. See my point? So this is why I wanted to mention Ken Oven as another illustration. Illustration. Hey, brother, how you doing, Rob Christian? You know this man. He's a nightmare for Islam. Do I need to mention him? B bless his brother by subscribing to his channel and <clears throat> watching his videos and hit like. Now, why did I show you this clip? For the following reasons. Kent Hoven is an illustration of what I've said for years. Every apologist, theologian that I know, has serious psychological, emotional issues. Every one. I'm not lying. Everyone that I've met has some serious issues, either emotionally, psychologically, or in his life or her life. Number two, because God is pleased, learn these lessons, guys. Please learn these lessons. Because God is pleased to use imperfect, fallen, damaged human vessels, <clears throat> you must guard your heart and never idolize these human vessels. Look to them <clears throat> as you look to Jesus. Cling to them and blindly follow them because they will break your heart and disappoint you. I guarantee you that. Guaranteed. And if your hope is in them, if they break your heart, if they fall, or if they do something to hurt you, your faith will be shattered because you didn't have true faith because your faith wasn't anchored in Christ, but in them. How many people fell from the faith when Ravi Zacharias <clears throat> was exposed? Or how many people lost faith when Nabil Krishi died of cancer at a young age because they took it as maybe God was punishing him for converting to a false religion? Because that's what the Muslim said. You get my point? You see? Number three, the third thing is pray and fast for those that you see on the front line that God is using to bless you. We need your prayers. We need protection. I need the Lord to sanctify me. I'm being honest. You guys see it. I try to control myself live. And for the most part, I'm okay. It's when I feel betrayed or attacked or someone presses my buttons that I can get to a point where I lose my control, get angry, and I cuss like a sailor. I do. And as I get older, I get more impatient. Right? I don't, I'm not getting more patient. I don't know why. I thought, I really thought as I grew older, I'd be more like Christ. And I'm finding out, no, as I'm getting older, I'm getting more angry, more impatient, and I'm becoming more sarcastic. May the Lord Jesus Almighty, in his love for us, Heal us, wash us, purify us, and save me from being consumed by my sinful lust and my imperfections and falling for satanic temptation so I don't dishonor and shame Jesus and break his heart. So keep that in mind, right? Keep that in mind. So I wanted this to be a teaching lesson. Now, this is all preparatory. Like I said, I'm going to go real slow. There was another point I want to address because, Lord willing, in the upcoming week, I will be doing a series exposing James White. 
and it'll be titled, Why James White's Arguments for Sola Scriptura Are Pathetically Bad. So don't rush me. We're going to take time on this. This is part one. We're going to get there, but you got to be patient with me, brethren. As Holy Spirit leads, and we yield to him. I want to give you a foretaste to help you guys dismantle the misuse of 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17 is misused by folks like James White and Anthony Rogers to prove too much, which ends up backfiring against them. So can I take a moment to address that as a way of whetting your appetites for what's to come in that upcoming series? Are you guys okay with that? Okay, because I'm going to show you how to use this against those Protestants who butcher 2 Timothy 3 and misuse it to get you to deny or walk away from the apostolic faiths, the Catholic Church and its traditions, or the Orthodox Church and its traditions, or so on and so forth. So if you're okay, let's do it now. Usually Protestant believer post verses from good. Now we got Miriam Alexandria and Full Armor Apologetics. And by the way, subscribe to Full Armor Apologetics. This young man, this handsome Armenian brother loves the Lord, has an excellent YouTube channel. He brings in some heavy hitters and interviews them. Help these channels go viral. Or we already have some brothers who are already blessed. Christian Prince, he can talk about the weather. He gets 2,000 people. No kidding. He'll he'll talk about the weather in, let's say, the Netherlands. 2,000 people. Apostate prophet. Right? I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to upset this guy. Apostate prophet. As hideously ugly as he is, and as boring as he is, does a live stream, he'll get 800, 900. And if he brings David Wood, someone more ugly than him, they go about 1,500. Okay? So some channels already are going viral. There are other channels whose contents are good, if not better, and solid, that still need more supporters and views. Rob Christian is one of them. I don't know if Al Fadi, I think even Al Fadi, Sarah, right? So... Support these fledgling ministries because they got excellent content for the glory of the triune God. You got someone like Paul Williams who just started less than a year ago. Already he's got over 60,000 subscribers and his videos gets like tens of thousands. And all the dude does, he'll read a book with his British accent or interview people. Okay. Right. So now with that said, let me show you how to use 2 Timothy 3, 14, 17 against James White. And I'll do a much more in-depth response to pathetic arguments for Sola Scriptura. Are you ready now? Full armor apologetics. Do you want to post verses for me or no? Or do you want Miriam Alexandria, who noticed that I'm getting buffed? Okay. Listen, I'm old enough to be some of you people's father. Okay. Sucks being you, sucks being me. If I was in my 20s and single, I'd probably marry you, whoever you are that's in love with me. Guard your heart, sisters. I'm 49. If you're in your 20s, I'm off the table. Don't even be thinking about me. Find you a young man close to your age who's not married, who loves Jesus, who's on fire for Jesus. Make sure he's on fire for Jesus. He loves Jesus more than his life. Then you'll have a pleasant marriage, as long as you're not a Jezebel. If you're a Jezebel, stay away from my brothers, or they're my sons, because they're Young enough, I can be their dads. Okay? Stay away. Haters. All right. Now, full armor, are you there? Are you going to post? By the way, full armor apologetics. I don't, you know, he is young. He's a handsome guy. Honestly, he is. He's so handsome that he makes me sin in my heart because I get envious. And I'm hoping he'll fall off his bicycle or skateboard. And break some of his teeth and scar his face like Muhammad did at the Battle of Uhud. So that at least I can feel better about myself. No, the guy's a handsome guy. Young man who loves the Lord. Sadly. He's handsome. All right. All right. 2 Timothy 3, 14, 17. Brother, you want to post it? 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Well, you are, brother. I mean, I, I can't bear false witness, right? See? I can't lie and say you're ugly. You're handsome. That's why I can't bear false witness. Apostate prophet is ugly. David Wood is one of the ugliest white dudes you'll meet. I can't lie and say they're good looking. Then I'd be sinning. That's why I can't lie and say you're ugly because you are handsome. All right. 
Okay, I'm sorry, Miriam Alexandria. Put 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17 if you can. 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17 if you can, sister. Right? I can't lie, guys. Did it? I can't lie. You want me to lie? Oh, yeah. If apostate prophet were to do modeling, he'd be on every cover of every magazine. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, I, and I'm Mr. Olympia. <laughs> and I'm the UFC champion. And I'm Bruce Lee's teacher. <laughs> okay, let's read. Are we ready now? Okay, she's posting. Thank you, sister. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 17. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Okay, now pay attention. I'm going to show you how to turn this against Jim, Jimmy White and Anthony. Antonia Nero Rogers. Antoine Diocletian Rogers. And that from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. You, Timothy, have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay? Now, the Scriptures are given to give you the necessary wisdom to know who Jesus is so you can trust in him to be saved. So, amen. Now watch. All Scriptures given by inspiration of God, breathed out by God, and is profitable. It will profit you for your doctrine. It will show you what you're supposed to affirm. For reproof, it will also rebuke you when necessary. For correction, it will also correct your bad theology and your bad living. For instruction righteousness, it will tell you how to live a life that is pleasing and righteous in the sight of God. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, for some reason, James White thinks that this passage is a powerful weapon to refute the traditions of the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Coptic Church, and the Syrian Church of the East. Now, let me turn this against him. Let me turn this against him. And Antonia Diocletian Rogers and his Calvinist Reich, the Knights, you know, Nazi Reich. Anyway, you ready? So the scriptures will tell me all I need to know, all I need to do, all I need to believe. For my salvation and holiness. Let me repeat. The scriptures will tell me everything I need to be saved and live a holy life pleasing to the Lord Jesus. Okay? All right. Now, with that said, let's see what the scriptures say we need. You need. I need. What do I need, according to scriptures, in order to... <clears throat> Find salvation in Jesus, be united to Christ, and in order to live a life that is pleasing and righteous in the sight of God. Okay, let's see. Well, here's what you need. 2 Timothy 1, 13 to 14, and chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. 2 Timothy 1, 13 to 14, and chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Now remember, there are no chapter divisions in the Greek manuscripts. So 2 Timothy 1, 13 flows right into chapter 2, verse 2. So let's compare Watch this. Okay, now watch this. 2 Timothy 1, 13 to 14. And then chapter 2, verse 1 to 2. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me. So the scriptures are telling Paul taught Timothy orally by word of mouth. The sound words that Timothy had to hold fast to and the love which are in Christ Jesus, the love that Jesus has for you and the love that Jesus fills you with in union with him, that good thing, the good thing that I gave to you, which was committed to you, I entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. So, Timothy, what you've heard from me, you will now guard and preserve by the Holy Spirit in us. So now the Holy Spirit will empower you and enable you to preserve the truth you receive from me. But then 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. That's why I kept saying it. We're waiting for the sister to post. If you can't do it, sister, let me know. I'll just go to the Bible online. It says your fingers are cold. Why? Is it freezing there? Hater. Why don't you get you a heater, man? 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. If you can't do it, sister, let me know so I can move on. Because full arm apologetics every other day wants to post, but today he just wants to sit back and gloat in the fact that I said he was handsome. All right, you're ugly, dude. You, therefore, my son, 
You, therefore, my son, be strong in the favor that is in Christ Jesus, in the favor that Jesus has bestowed on you. Now watch here. And the things that you have heard from me, you heard orally from me among many witnesses, in front of multiple witnesses who will testify you're not making things up. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Wow. Who would have thunk it? The very scriptures that tell me what I need tells me that Paul <clears throat> taught men, appointed men, reliable men <clears throat> who received direct instruction from Paul in front of multiple witnesses to confirm, yes, Timothy heard this from Paul, that they would then preserve Act on and then pass on to other reliable men who would then also preserve it, act upon it, and spread it. You caught it? Now, why in front of many witnesses? Because Timothy could say anything. Well, Paul told me this. Well, how do we know? We were not there. That's why Paul said, when I taught it, I made sure there were witnesses. Because the Bible says at the mouth of two or three witnesses. So, Timothy, I didn't teach you in secret. I taught you in public in front of multiple witnesses so they could then verify and confirm. Yes, Paul did say this to Timothy and to us because we were there and we're witnesses. Right? So then the Bible tells us, Sola Scriptura tells us, as defined by James White, that the Holy Spirit has raised up Men directly taught by the apostles, the deposit of faith that they would guard and preserve by the power of the Holy Spirit and pass on to reliable witnesses. Okay? Second thing you do, 1 Timothy 3.15. 1 Timothy 3.15. Guys, understand how to present these passages the way I do. A lot of times Catholics drop the ball in articulating these passages but because I used to think like James White, I have an advantage because I know how to articulate these passages to get the most out of them to silence his distortion of Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 Timothy 3.15. This one is a doozy. But if I'm delayed, he's talking to Timothy. If I'm delayed in being released and getting to you in time, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God the house of God, how do you behave in God's house? It's not your house, it's his house, and he has rules to stay in his house, or he's going to throw you out of his house. And what is God's house? Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Now, here's where you're going to destroy Protestantism. Sorry, Protestants. James White will say, see, the church upholds the truth. It's not the truth, but it whole upholds it in his rant against Catholicism. All right. But guys, think with me. If the church is the pillar that holds up the truth of God's word, it holds it up. And it's the foundation where the truth of God rests. Is the truth indefectible? Can the truth be lost or destroyed? Can God's truth ever be lost, destroyed, or is it indefectible? Answer that question for me. Can the truth ever be lost? Well, then you become a Muslim. Can it ever vanish, disappear, and be destroyed? Come on, guys. Give me feedback so we can enter into the discussion of Mark. Okay. No, right? Well, now you got a problem. If the truth is indefectible... What about its pillar and foundation? Would God erect a pillar and foundation that's defectible, that can be destroyed, that can lose its way? Well, if the truth is indefectible, then surely God would make sure that its pillar and foundation are indefectible. Because if its pillar and foundation are defectible, can be destroyed? then that means the truth will be lost because it's that pillar and foundation where you find the truth. But if the pillar and the foundation are defectable and can be destroyed and lost, 
Where then can you find the truth? You see the point? Why you can't be a Protestant anymore? Because then that means, from the time of the apostles, the true church has always prevailed and has remained constant throughout the centuries. So where was the true church in the second century, third century, fourth century, fifth century? It wasn't Anthony Rogers Calvinism. It wasn't Anthony Rogers Presbyterianism. It wasn't Anthony Rogers Reformation. It wasn't Anthony Rogers Reformers. You caught it now? If the truth, truth is indefectible, then its pillar and foundation must be indefectible because if the pillar and the foundation can be destroyed, are faulty and can perish, then where will you find the truth? Because the truth is held up by the church and its foundation is the church. So if the church can be destroyed and lost, where then does the truth lay? Where do you find it? Don't tell me scriptures because those scriptures are the very scriptures that the church is preserving, copying, studying, meditating, articulating, and defending. You get it now? So where is it? Where is it? Now, Rinan, I understand your Orthodox, you believe Orthodox Church. Calm down, buddy. Don't alienate the other apostolic traditions. It's what you believe, that's fine. Catholics say they are. It's okay. We're not here to debate that issue right now. You understand my point? So Protestants want you to believe that the church is the pillar and foundation, even though they can't find their doctrines in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries, but they know they cannot say that the church was lost because they would be blasphemers and Bible perverts because then they'd have to go the route of Mormonism, Joe's Witnesses, Campbellites, Millerites, these groups who in the 19th century were restorationists because they, they, they believed the church was lost from the 2nd century and then had to be restored. Blasphemy. You get my point? Restorationists. You see my point? So that's what I'm going to do to James White in the upcoming series. In the upcoming series, that's what I'm going to be doing. A lot more. I just want to whet your appetite. So 1 Timothy 3.15, if you understand it and you properly exegete it, it is a nightmare to the misuse and abuse of 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Because the same Timothy that tells us all scripture is breathed out by God and will give you everything necessary, all you need to know how to be saved and live the high, uh, uh, moral, holy life, is the same scripture says God gave you the church to uphold that truth, to preserve the truth, to articulate the truth, to explain the truth, defend the truth of God's word. But you got to understand how to use 1 Timothy 3.15. I like what Seraph Molit said. That is blasphemy. That is why I have to leave Protestantism. This is why Anthony's manifesting like a demon, like a fat demon, and attacking me personally and trying to slander my character. Because he can't refute the facts. He knows he's a kid, and I will spank him. And again, I'm not being arrogant. He's not on my level, though he thinks he is. I'll take his degree from his... Protestant seminary and use it like the Quran for toilet paper. Sorry, guys. I have to be blunt. More of that to come. So are we now ready with all of that in the background? All of that is warm up. Sorry. Pray for my sight physically and spiritually that the last thing that goes on on me is my voice and my eyes. So I can use my eyes to study the word and my voice to glorify Christ with my dying breath. If the Lord tarries because, man, I need glasses. Everyone ready? Everyone ready? Are we now ready for the main event? Dum, dum, da, da, da. Are we ready for the main event? No, uh, uh, see, Sess, let me give you a better argument. Let me answer this real quickly. If they say having an icon of Jesus or Mary, 
or a statue of Jesus Mary is blasphemous. Then you ask those Protestants, guys, Marcel, everyone listen to this. Say, do you have children's books and movies depicting the Bible, either in cartoon images or <clears throat> actors playing Jesus or Mary? For example, do you let your kids read the children's Bible full of comic illustrations of biblical figures? Do you let them watch cartoons on the stories of the Bible? Do you watch movies about the Bible played by actors? Well, you're doing the very thing you just condemned me for. You are allowing your children or yourself to view images and icons. In fact, moving images. Cartoons are nothing but images in motion. Depicting biblical characters when you don't know what those characters look like. And yet you still watch those cartoons, read those comics or children's Bibles full of comic illustrations or watch movies depicting biblical characters, you hypocrite. Right? How many Protestants, you know, will let their kids watch an animated series of biblical stories like Jesus or Joseph and his brothers or here, like the Prince of Egypt, the movie The Prince of Egypt. How many Protestants went to see The Prince of Egypt? Which is nothing but icons in motion. That's icons. Because in the ancient world, they didn't have the ability to make movies or cartoons. So the icons are nothing other than comic illustrations, cartoons depicting biblical realities. Right? Everyone got it now? In fact, you know what's amazing? You guys want to get blown away? In 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 and Colossians 1.15, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Colossians 1.15, there, if you read the New Testament, it says Jesus is the image of God. You know what the word is there? You Greeks already know that. You already know it. It's icon. In the Greek, it says Jesus is the icon of the invisible God. Icon of God. Icon, icon is the Greek word from which we get icon. So Jesus is the living, breathing, human icon of God. Oof, e, ah, oh. And 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7, it says man, the male, the male, the man, Adam, the male. He is the icon and doxas of God, the Icon of God. Ooh, ee, ah. <laughs> this is why John the Damascene, John of Damascus, was against the iconoclasts, those Christians who condemn imagery, because John of Damascus realized if you're going to condemn icons, then you condemn the incarnation, because the incarnation, Jesus' is enfleshment, is the greatest icon of God. The only perfect icon of God, because that's what the incarnation was. God being imaged visibly as a man. You got it? No, well, Muslims tell you they're iconoclasts. They lie, baby. You know why they lie? Because if they're iconoclasts, why do they still have a black stone that Muhammad and those who follow him smother, smooch, kiss, and touch, and weep on? A black stone that, according to certain authentic narrations, will come to life, it will be given eyes and a tongue to intercede for those that smothered it, that touched it, and kissed it, defending them before Allah. Wallah <laughs> Okay, are we ready now? Are we ready now? Let's get ready to rumble. We ready now for Mark 1332? B52, B52, B52. All right. Who's going to post? Should I just read or someone's going to read for me? 
not read. I'm going to read. Should I post or someone's going to post for me? Miriam, can you still post or is this too cold? Are you just thinking, Miriam? Are you just freezing? Oh, I'm so cold because I don't have a heater in my house. I'm too cheap. Gas is high. I can't afford inflation. I can't. I, 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 I got to bring some wood and burn it. But if I do that, it's going to burn my house. Okay. Mark 13, 32. Mark 13, 32. Well, why you want to be fast? Why don't you be a little slow? Long, that means slow instead of being fast. That's an oxymoron. To be long means you're very slow. To be fast means you're speeding things up. So you're either slow and long or fast and quick. Come on, Miriam. Stop it. All right, Mark 13, 32. Oh, Protestant believers here? He's here. All right. That Protestant is here. The Kenny Rogers look like is here, son. Oh, yeah. Pro Kenny, a.k.a. Protestant. By the night is believer Rogers is here. All right. Kenny, get around. Maybe I'll in a great place. Oh, hold on. Oh, hold on. Oh, Oh, you're all I want. You're all I want. You're all I want. All right. Protestant believer, post Mark 13 32 for us. L for love, Luther. L for love. Mark 13 No wonder Anthony called me a malignant narcissist. Oh, I'm going to lose sleep. Mark 13, 32, brother. Let's do it. Let's get into it, man. Get a, get an amen. But of that day and the hour knoweth no man, not the angels, which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Aha! See? He can't be God, boy. He can't be God. He don't know the day or hour, son. Can't be God. Fuck up. All right. Now, the parallel, Matthew 24, 36. Matthew 24, 36, the parallel. Watch here. So let's begin now. Now we begin. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father alone. But my father only alone. That thing over Trinity, the over thing. Get it over with. All right. Now let's begin. Are we ready now? Now, let's learn how not to interpret the Bible and how to interpret the Bible. Keep these in mind. Seek the face of the Holy Spirit to help you understand, as I trust the Spirit, to enable me to teach you so we can all grow together for the glory of Christ. All right. Depending on the person asking the question, that will directly impact the way I answer the question. Okay, let's begin. Point number one, you need to take into consideration your audience. You need to take into consideration the individual or individuals that are asking the question and their motives. Are they asking because they want to know sincerely? Or are they asking because they want to refute your belief in the deity of Christ? That's the first thing you need to keep in mind. So once you decipher and discern your audience, their background, and why they're asking, then you can proceed to explain appropriately. In other words, if it's a baby Christian or someone who's open to the truth and a seeker and really wants to know and believes that all of the Bible is the word of God, even someone who's not a Christian but believes, all right, I do trust the books of the Bible, that they're historically accurate in God's words and they are consistent, but I want to know what the Bible teaches about who Jesus is so I can Put my faith in him. If you're dealing with those individuals that already believe that the Bible in its totality is historically accurate, inspired words of God that do not contradict, or someone who may not be a Christian but has come to that conclusion, that conviction. For example, you may have family members raised in Christian homes who have not given their life to Jesus yet but do believe the Bible is true and do believe the Bible is consistent. They believe that and they believe it's consistent but they don't know what to believe about salvation or who God is or who Jesus is or who or what the spirit is. That will affect your approach. With that individual, 
I would use what the Bible teaches as a whole. So I may not just stick with Mark or Matthew. I may look outside of Mark and Matthew to bring in other verses and witnesses to get the more complete and fuller picture and a more accurate understanding of what this verse means and who Jesus is. Similarly, if I'm dealing with a Jehovah Witness or a biblical Unitarian, a Jehovah Witness and a biblical Unitarian will tell you they believe in the totality of Scripture. They believe all the books of the Bible are historically accurate and inspired. They don't contradict. So I can use this approach with them. Okay? I can use this approach with them. So you, have, you got that first part. Because I got to lay a lot of groundwork and foundation before I proceed. So anyone who believes that the entire Bible is consistent and not contradictory and historically accurate and or inspired, you can go outside of Mark, if they're quoting Mark 13.32, outside of Matthew, if they're quoting Matthew 24.36, and look to other writers who are inspired, other verses, other books, and bring them in to get the total picture, the complete picture, to get a more proper understanding of who and what Jesus is. However, if your audience happens to be a Muslim who doesn't think the Bible's consistent, who thinks that the Bible books contradict one another, like Shabra Ali, or an agnostic atheist like Bart Ehrman, who also thinks the same, your approach is going to have to change. What do I mean? If you go to Paul to explain Mark, you're falling into the hands of the agnostic atheist Bart Ehrman and or Muslim who says, exactly, you need to go to Paul to explain Mark because Mark is a difficulty for you and Mark doesn't agree with Paul, contradicts Paul, which is why Paul <clears throat> has a different view of Jesus and a higher view of Jesus than that found in Mark. So that's not going to work. Exactly, Korea Lason. I like what you said. The Unitarians and JWs believe the totality of the scriptures that a Trinitarian church preserved. Exactly. Do you understand? If you're dealing with a Muslim like Shir Ali, if you're dealing with an agnostic atheist like Bart Ehrman, they don't think the books of the Bible are historically accurate, let alone inspired, and that they're consistent with one another. Shir Ali, parroting people like Bart Ehrman, thinks that Mark's view of Jesus is not as developed as John's view of Jesus or Paul's view. So to go outside of Mark, to explain Mark, you're falling into their snare and their trap. They'll say, yeah, that's what Paul believed, but that's not what Mark believed. All you did was prove to me there's a contradiction. So did you get that second point? I can't move on if you're not getting these points. Okay, are you getting that? Did you get it? Now, so if you're dealing with a Bart Ehrman or Shabra Ali, you must stick with that book that they're quoting. If they're going to quote Mark, you prove your point from Mark. If they're going to quote Matthew, you prove your point from Matthew. You don't venture to John or Paul or Isaiah. You stick with the very author or book they're citing and refute them from that very author or book. With me there? Please remember these facts. Seek the face of the Holy Spirit to help you understand. Okay? I'm going to show you how these two approaches work differently. Third thing I want you to realize, and this is the fault of Christians who are not trained in exegesis. When someone runs to Mark 13, 32 and Matthew 24, 36 to deny the Trinity or deity of Christ and you let them get away with it, then the fault is on you. Why? Listen to this point, please. You got to listen to this point. Like I said, it's only part one. We got a lot more coming. A lot of in-depth exegesis of Mark and Matthew, Lord willing. If the Lord enables me through your prayers to remain faithful and holy and pure and healthy enough to glorify the Lord. <clears throat> Why would you allow someone to take a verse from the middle of the book and from the middle of a chapter and not press the person?
to address what that verse means in the chapter itself and in the book as a whole. In other words, Mark 13, 32 is near the end of Mark. Why did you ignore Mark 1 to 12 and Mark 13, verse 1 to 31, all of which comes before verse 32, all of which has a lot to tell us about who Jesus is and what he does. So I'm going to ignore the first 12 chapters, and I'm going to ignore the first 31 verses of Mark 13 and focus on 32 that is in the middle of Mark 13 and near the end of the book and ignore all that came before it, all that Mark has already told me about who Jesus is, where he came from, what he does. You get my point? But it's your fault that you let them get away with it. You get my point? Why would you let them get away with it? Say, hey, man, why are you quoting Mark 13, 32? Did you read verses 1 to 31 yet? Show? Okay, tell me what the context is. Did you read Mark 1, how Mark began? Did you read Mark 2, Mark 3, Mark 4? Because Mark has already prepared you to how not to interpret Mark 13, 32 and how to interpret correctly because he's already told you so much about Jesus, enough about Jesus's identity by what Jesus claims and does to prepare you for Mark 13, 32 so that you don't misinterpret it. The same thing with Matthew 24, 36. So this is... Another rule that you need to master and remember, do not ever allow someone to take a verse in the middle or near the end of the book or in the middle or the, near the end of a chapter and not force that person to interpret that verse in light of that chapter itself and what came before it and what comes after it. So the fault is on us for allowing them to get away with murder. And this is the problem with debates. When you have debates with time limits, you can't give a thorough response because you don't have enough time. Everyone got that? Before I move on? So do we get all these points? These are the points you must keep in mind. Number one, know who your audience is and what their intention are. If it's someone who's sincerely asking because he wants to know, and if that someone believes that all the Bible books are consistent and accurate, do not contradict, then you can give them a very easy answer by going outside of Mark 13, 32 or Matthew 24, 36, bring in other witnesses and verses to give a more complete picture of who Jesus is and a better understanding of these words. But if your audience is someone who thinks the Bible is full of contradictions and different authors had different theologies that were in conflict, then you must stay with the very author or the book or the writings of that author to give a proper response. So now let's take the first approach. And the third thing, keep in mind, is that you never interpret a verse outside of its immediate context, the chapter that it's found, and outside of that which came before and after. Since Mark 13 is near the end, I don't interpret Mark 13, 32 out of the context of the first 31 verses of Mark 13 and the first 12 chapters. I need to first study all those chapters to get a proper, correct view of who Jesus is, according to Mark, to then more accurately and properly understand verse 32 of Mark 13. Everyone got these three facts? Because now I'm going to show you if it's a Christian who believes the Bible is consistent and doesn't contradict, or someone who believes the Bible is consistent, doesn't contradict, though he may not be a Christian, or he may be a, a cult member like the Jehovah's Witnesses, and asking sincerely, here's how I'd answer it. Now, this is how I answer it to that particular individual. I'd say, so you do believe the Bible books are consistent, right? Yeah. They don't contradict one another, right? Yeah. So Mark's view of Jesus doesn't contradict John's view of Jesus, right? No. And Paul's view of Jesus doesn't contradict Mark's view of Jesus, right? No. They all are consistent, and they all believe the same thing about Jesus. All right. Excellent. So since you believe the Bible's cons cons consistent and doesn't contradict, I want you to explain to me 
how you would harmonize the following statements. So this is the approach I take with that person who's asking sincerely and or assumes that all the Bible, Bible books are consistent and they don't contradict. So let's begin, shall we? Are we ready? I just want to make sure you're ready. So are you ready? Come on, guys. Remember, I'm just beginning. This is scratching the surface. There's a lot more in-depth exegesis in me by the power of the Holy Spirit, if he's pleased, to use me for that purpose coming in the subsequent parts. All right. So then let's go to 1 John 3.20. 1 John 3.20. And Protestant believer, thank you, brother, for posting for us. 1 John 3.20. Watch here. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So your first question is, what does it mean that God knows all things? Well, he's omniscient. He knows everything. Okay. Can a creature know all things? No. Can a creature know everything? No. Right? So... Have them look at this passage and ask them to affirm whether this proves that God is omniscient. God is greater than our hearts, how we feel, and knows all things. So he's omniscient. All right, excellent. Now let's go to John 16, 25 to 31. Watch here, guys. Follow with me. This works for that first group, that imaginary group. This won't work for the Shibralis or Bart Ehrman's who don't think the biblical books are consistent and free of error, but think that different writers believe different things that were in conflict. John 16, 25 to 31. Read with me, guys. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. Pay attention. I won't speak figuratively. I'm going to speak plainly and literally. And that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. And I believe that I came forth from God. Now watch. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I, I leave the world and go to the Father. Now watch here. His disciples said to him, see now. You are speaking plainly. Everyone listen. Sarah, everyone. Notice the disciples say, so now you're not speaking figuratively. You're speaking plainly and clearly. Plain, explicit language. Not figuratively, so you can't explain this away as allegorical. You're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. You're using no figure of speech. You're not speaking allegorically, so we misunderstand you. Now we are sure that you know all things. And this is before his death while he's on earth. And have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Now, Jesus, if he doesn't know all things, should say, stop that. You didn't get my point, man. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? So now you believe that I know all things and you don't need to question me to test me to see if I do? And now you get that I came from the Father out of heaven. So when Jesus speaks plainly, the disciples finally get it. You know all things. We don't need to question you anymore to know whether you know what you're talking about. Because now we're convinced you know all things. And you came from the Father out of heaven into the world. No, even then, Jeremy, that doesn't work. Because there's a variant reading in 1 John. And even in 1 John... There, the all things that you know pertains to what he just addressed in immediate context. You know, everything necessary for salvation to live a holy life. But here, there's no qualification, Jeremy. That qualification does not appear here. I know they're games. Now, but coming back to the issue, let me explain what it means. You don't need anyone to question you. People ask questions for one of two reasons. People ask questions for one of two reasons. They ask because they want to learn or they ask in order to test you to see if you know what you're talking about. So when the disciples say, you know, all things and you need no one to question you, meaning now 
we're convinced we don't need to question to see if you really know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah? Well, what about this? Oh, so you think you know? Well, explain this to me. So you ask questions either to learn or you ask questions to see if the person knows what he's talking, talking about or he's a fraud. Like when I ask Muslim questions or CP ask Muslim questions, you get the point? So you mean the Bible tells us the same Jesus who said of the dare hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the son, but the father alone is the same seed Jesus who accepts and affirms that he knows all things and doesn't need to be questioned whether he knows everything. And notice this is before his death and resurrection. God bless you. God is in control. And the Lord preserve us for his glory. Everyone got it so far? Before I move on, I got to make sure again. Remember, class has begun. I need you guys to get it. What about after the resurrection? Three weeks after Jesus' resurrection, the disciples are fishing, waiting the Lord's instructions. And they see him on the shore. And Peter runs to him before the boat gets to the shore. And Jesus is cooking fish for them. And then says the following. He asked Peter three times, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now, when he asked him the third time, notice what Peter says. John 21, 17. John 21, 17. Man, I'm getting old. John 21, 17. Watch here. Watch here, guys. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Here's proof Jesus is not asking Simon because he doesn't know. Because he would have gotten the answer the first two times. So Peter, knowing that Jesus is the omniscient Lord, notice he's the Lord who knows all things. So he's the omniscient Lord. In other words, what Peter's saying, why do you keep asking me? You know everything. You, you already know whether I love you or not. So why are you asking me, Lord? Why are you asking me if I love you? You know all things. You're omniscient. You're the omniscient Lord. You know my heart. You know whether I love you or not. So why do you need to ask me? See, this passage moves me always when I read it. I swear to you, every time I read it, I want to cry. Do you know why? I'm going to tell you why. And I mentioned in the past. See, I'm about to cry now, honestly. But remember, I'm a malignant narcissist. So I'm putting on a show. I didn't forget that. Okay, here, here, here's why this moves me. If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, even John, especially Mark 14, Peter tells Jesus he died with him. And Jesus says, will you, Peter? He goes, truly, I tell you, before the cock crows thrice, you will deny me three times. He goes, never. And lo and behold, Peter fled when Jesus was arrested. And in the court, when he's witnessing Jesus being tried and asked if he knew Jesus, it says he denied him three times. And in Luke 22, it says, after he denied him third time, he saw Jesus looked at him. It's Luke 22. And Jesus looked at him right after he denied him the third time. It's in Luke 22. And then it says, Peter ran away. <clears throat> And he wept bitterly. Why does it move me? Can you imagine? You fulfill what Jesus said you would do before you do it. And you denied him three times because you didn't want to be arrested and beaten and killed with him. And then after the third time, it says he looked and Jesus looked at him. And he could see Jesus as he's being tried, looking at him after he denied him third times. <clears throat> and then Peter, it says, ran off. And it says he wept bitterly. <clears throat> now, why does this move me? It moves me because Peter didn't understand what Jesus was doing. Jesus wasn't trying to shame Peter. He was gently, lovingly restoring Peter and have him repent and confess his love for every time he betrayed him. That's why... He asked him three times to restore him 
and to heal his heart for the three times he betrayed him. Notice three times he asked him, and Peter denying him three times. I do not know that man. And this, so the Lord asks him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. You know I do. I do not know that man. Simon, son of Jonah, John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know I do. I tell you, I do not know that man. Simon, son of John, do you love me? More than these? Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. <clears throat> That's how merciful Jesus is. That's why it moves me in my heart. By the way, this is an ancient interpretation you'll find even among the church fathers. So you don't think I'm making it up. They even saw the connection that the Lord asked him three times to restore him for the three times that he denied him. But see how beautiful the Lord is? Do you see how merciful? He didn't rebuke Peter and shame Peter and made Peter feel make Peter feel worthless. He could have done that. How do you feel, Peter? Did I tell you you're going to deny me three times? Me? All these years? That's it's not what he did. He didn't do that. As a gentle shepherd, gently leading his flock, he restored him, right? And it's obvious why the Lord would restore him, because you can only imagine the guilt and shame he felt being around Jesus, because he'd always be reminded, and he would always think about how he betrayed him three times, and that Jesus was there to see and hear him betray him, and the guilt and the shame he was feeling being next to the Lord. And what does Jesus say? I remember your sins no more. I won't raise them up and mention them. They've been erased. And the Lord never brings that up and shames Peter, but he restores Peter. So these passages are not written so much to give you theology of the Trinity. They're written for another reason. So when John 21 is written, it's not because John wants you to know that Jesus is almighty God in the flesh. It was everything. That's a passing point. There's another point that he's making. The gentle heart of your Savior who doesn't want to shame you, who doesn't want to humiliate you or embarrass you. Rather, he wants to gently lead you and restore you in his love. That's the point. And now another point the Lord wants us to take from that. The other point is, do you love me? You Christians, do you love me? Well, I want you to show your love for me. If you keep my word and obey me, that means you love me. Well, here's one command I give you. If you love me, care for one another. Feed one another. Serve one another. That's what he told Peter. Peter, you love me? Tend my flock. Feed my sheep. Love me by your deeds. And one of the deeds which shows that you love me is to love one another and serve one another. That's the heart of Jesus. You get my point? So, but now coming back to the issue again. Did Jesus know all things before he died? Yes. Did he still know all things after he died? Yes. Was there a moment on earth where he... <clears throat> Lacked omniscience, didn't all things? No, he always knew all things. He was always omniscient, even before and after the resurrection. I just gave it to you from John. But there's more. Are you ready? I got more. Are you ready? I got a lot more. So let's go to Colossians 2, verses 2 to 3. Colossians 2, verses 2 to 3. You see why the story of Peter moves me, guys? His story moves me. Every time John 21 I read, man, I'm cut at the heart. Okay, Colossians 2, verses 2 to 3. Focus, brethren, focus. Colossians 2, verses 2 to 3. That their hearts may be encouraged, 
being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom, now notice, in Jesus, in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Did you catch it? All of God's infinite wisdom and knowledge are in Christ, possessed by Christ. Christ possesses the infinite, unsearchable treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge. Is God's wisdom and knowledge infinite? Yes. Who possesses the infinite wisdom and knowledge of, of God? Where is the infinite wisdom and knowledge of God found? In Jesus Christ. Now let's go to Romans 11, 33 to 34. Specifically, Romans 11, 33. Watch here. Romans 11, 33, 34. Now fo fo focus with me, brethren. Listen and focus. Romans 11, 33, 34. It says, in Christ, not some, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Whose wisdom and knowledge? God's. Now, but watch this. Romans 11, 33, 34. Notice 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Notice the depth, how deep are the riches of God's wisdom and knowledge. How unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Can I ask you guys a question to see if you're listening? If the riches of the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God are unsearchable, beyond passing, beyond discovering, beyond finding out, unsearchable, you cannot fathom them. You can't search them out. That's how infinitely wise and knowledgeable God is. But those riches... The infinite, unsearchable riches of God's wisdom and knowledge are in Christ fully. Christ possesses the fullness of the riches of God's wisdom and knowledge. How can he be a mere creature? We're just told that the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God are unsearchable beyond traversing for finite creatures. But then the same Paul wrote in Colossians 2.3, in Jesus Christ, all, not some, all, the entire riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God are his, in him, possessed by him. So if you want that wisdom and knowledge, you need to go to him. How? How is that possible if Jesus is not omniscient, if Jesus is not all-knowing and almighty? Right? Right? Are we getting that? Before I move on? Yep. The Holy Spirit does in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 12. So we got it, right? So John and Paul affirm Jesus is all-knowing. He possesses the infinite, unsearchable riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Now let's see how rich Jesus is. Ephesians 3.8. Ephesians 3.8. Watch here. Ephesians 3.8. Okay. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints... This grace, this favor that I didn't deserve was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Bam! Christ is infinitely rich. His riches are beyond finding out and searching out. The same Christ who possesses the infinite riches of God's wisdom and knowledge in all its fullness. Sagi, if you want to debate, Skype me so I can bury you and silence you like the dog that you are. I don't know what you are. If you're an anti-Trinitarian, I'd love to humiliate you free of charge on my live stream. So call me so I can record your decimation. Don't act tough in the comment section. Everyone got that part? And don't waste my time if you're not going to have a serious debate. Did you get it? 
Well, the soggy croissant is what the Shias, the Shiite used when they did muta with the mommy. But put that aside. So is it clear from John and Paul, Jesus is infinitely wise and knowledgeable because he's omniscient and he's almighty? Is that clear? Have we established that thus far? I got a little more. And this is simply part one, guys. We got a lot more to traverse, a lot more to unpack. Just be patient, okay? Let me give you another one now. Let's go to Jeremiah 17.10. Jeremiah 17.10. Jeremiah 17, verse 10. Watch here. Jeremiah 17, 10. Okay, Saki, the Shia want your mother too. So unless you want them to have your mother, you want to debate, it's Skype. If not, get the hell out of here before he muzzle you. Shut your mouth like the Shia shut your mother's mouth. Now get out of here. Jeremiah 17, verse 10, guys. I, the Lord, pay attention. Jeremiah 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, Jehovah, search the heart. Who does that? I. I test the mind. Who does that? Jehovah, I. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Let me read that passage again. I, Jehovah, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So what attributes must Jehovah possess to search the hearts of every creature, to test and examine the mind of every creature, and to be able to perfectly repay you and reward you for everything you've thought, said, and done? What kind of attributes must Jehovah have? Notice what Jehovah said. I'm the one who searches the hearts. I'm the one who tests the minds, and I will repay everyone according to what they've done. What kind of attributes must Jehovah have to know all your thoughts, all your desires, what you're thinking in your heart, what you're imagining in your mind, and then perfectly repay you according to all you've said, thought, and done? What kind of attributes, guys? Come on, help me out. Gokis, don't chime in. Listen, because we're going to have to block you because you don't know as much as you think. Just shut up and listen, please. So what kind of attributes? He must be all-knowing, right? And he has to be omnipotent because he must be powerful enough and rich enough to repay you according to what you've done and do this for every creature from the start of creation to the end of the age. And that number is in the billions, right? Okay. Now, let's compare it with the words of our Lord. Revelation 2, verse 18 and 23. So let's skip. We're going to read Revelation 2, 18 and 23. And do me a favor, Protestant. If you can put Revelation 2, verse 18, jump to 23, and then put Jeremiah 17, 10 again. Because I want to work through this. I want to work through this. Okay, go kiss then zip it and learn so you won't be puzzled. If you keep talking, you're not learning, you won't understand, and we're going to have to get you out of here. Okay, so Revelation 2.18, and then 23, and Jeremiah 17.10. Three verses. God, I'm Jesus, boss, it's great. Okay. Okay, Revelation 2.18, and then verse 23, and Jeremiah 17.10. Watch here. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, these things says the Son of God. So Jesus is talking. These are the words of the Son of God, not the Father, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. So notice it's the Son of God speaking, not the Father. Now notice what the Son of God says. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he, I, the Son of God, am he, who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Boy, that sounds familiar. Hmm. Let's see what Jeremiah 17.10 says. I, Jehovah, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Wow. Jehovah says, I'm the one who searches the heart. I test the mind. And I'm the one who will give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. But the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, says in Revelation 2, 18 and 23, 
I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Why is Jesus speaking as if he's Jehovah of Jeremiah 17, verse 10? Help me out, guys. Did you see it? Come on, guys, help me out. Yeah, no shit. Come on, man. I hope the sound is okay, guys. I don't know what's going on. It's, it's buffering on my part. Is it okay to sound okay with you guys? Because mine, I'm buffering. I don't know why. Okay, so did you guys get that part? Jesus. All right. Uh, Gokas, you got to get out of here, buddy. Don't come back. I don't want a troll like you here again. Get out of here. Okay? You can't stop barking, so get the hell out of here, guy. Okay, so now, you guys got it? Jesus speaks as Jehovah God of Jeremiah 17.10. Okay? Jeremiah 17.10. He, just like Jehovah, says he is the one that searches hearts and minds and repay everyone according to their doing, according to the fruit of their work. But if that means for Jehovah to be able to know the hearts and thoughts of every creature and repay them accordingly and perfectly, that Jehovah is all-knowing, omniscient, all-powerful, then that also applies to Jesus because Jesus says he is the one. I am he. I am that one. I am that God in the Old Testament who says, I search the hearts, test the minds, to pay everyone accordingly. I am he. I am that one. And not another. Therefore, Jesus must be the omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful, sovereign Jehovah, who's the judge of all. So are you seeing how you're establishing from the totality scripture, the same Jesus who says, the day hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the son, but the father, is the same Jesus who claims, and his followers also believe, <clears throat> is the omniscient, Infinitely wise and knowledgeable, all-powerful Son of God. You following that or no? Because I got more. I'm not done yet. I got more. Sarah and everyone else, you, you're learning the depth of Scripture. So Jesus is not the Father. He's the Son of God who is all-knowing on earth before he died, after he died, continues to be all-knowing. Okay, everyone got it. I got to make sure this is for you guys. I'm doing this for you guys. You're learning about the Trinity. You're learning about the hypostatic union, Jesus, God, and man. You're learning about how to interpret scripture, how not to interpret scripture. You're learning about salvation and holiness because this passage means Jesus will judge us. So we need to yield to the Spirit, submit to the Spirit, and ask the Holy Spirit to mortify our flesh, destroy our lust, and empower us to walk in obedience because we know when we stand before the Lord, He will judge us due to our works that we've done as believers united to him. So you're learning a lot. Salvation, sanctification, eschatology, the last days, judgment, the life to come, glorification, trinity, deity, humanity, as well as how to interpret scripture. But now let's read Revelation 2.18 to 23 in context because there's an important message here. Revelation 2.18 to 23 in context. Jesus is talking to one of the seven churches established by the apostles, and he warns them. Here's the warning. Revelation 2, 18 to 23. Practical application, folks. May I practice what I preach and not be a hypocrite? Revelation 2, 18 to 23. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works. Now, I'm going to break it down and make it practical to impact the way we live. And may I not be a hypocrite. I know your works. I know your love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. 
Now, I'm explaining the significance of this. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality and eat things, sacrifice to idols. Now, let me unpack this. Bear with me. Here, the Lord tells you he sees everything everyone does. And he pays particular attention to churches. He's saying to churches then and now, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. He does not change. So he's now focusing on the church today like he focused back then. And he's saying to us, I'm aware of how you love, how you serve. I'm aware of your faithfulness or lack thereof and your patience. I'm aware of what you do. But I find some problems. So notice the Lord is telling churches, you better know for certain I am watching you and I'm paying close attention to all you do because you profess to be mine, my church, my bride, my servants. So I'm watching you carefully. You're getting that? Okay. Secondly, the Lord... Is telling us even in the lifetime of the apostles, guys, please listen. John, the apostle is alive when the Lord is giving him his revelation. Even in his lifetime, churches established by the apostles were being infiltrated, being destroyed by false teachers, false prophets. Because in the lifetime of John, a false prophetess had infiltrated the church at Thyatira, teaching them false doctrine to their destruction. Right, But now notice the corrective. The Lord will always make sure to raise up his true servants to expose false teaching, false prophets, false teachers to protect the flock and will never leave the church as orphans. So just like Satan sent in a false prophet, the Lord raised up a true prophet to expose that false prophet to protect the church. You get my point? I don't want to move on if you're not getting the meat of this. He never abandons the church. He's been with the church from day one. He's never abandoned the church. So you may have false teachers that come in, but God Almighty then raises up his true servants to expose the false teachers and silence them. This is why you can't be a Protestant anymore. Because where was the true church? and the true servants of God in the second, third, fourth centuries to expose the heretics, the Arius's, the Paul of Samosata, the Sibelius's. And why didn't they sound Protestant? See to my point? Why, if you understand what you're reading, I'm sorry, folks, you can't be a Protestant. You can't trust Anthony and his satanic, corrupt, demonic doctrines of Tulip because it's not there. It was not known. It was not taught by the true servants of the Lord who exposed heretics and heresies and false teachers and preserved the church. Where is Jimmy White's sola fide in the early church? Not there. Where is Anthony Nero's satanic doctrine of tulip in the early church? Not there. So where was it? See my point? You catching that? Now, the third thing I want you to learn. The Lord insists on purity. You'll have false teachers text killing you. It's okay to be sexually immoral. They won't call it immorality. It's okay to be gay. It's okay to be lesbianism. It's okay to be confused about your gender. It's okay to have sex before marriage. And Jesus says that is a mark of a false teacher because Jesus condemns sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is any sexual proclivity, any sexual intimacy that goes against God's standard. The only sexual intimacy that God allows is when a male, one born a male, not made a male, and one born a female, come together in holy matrimony 
as husband and wife to become one flesh. That's the only sex the Lord blesses. No sex before marriage, meaning I can't have a girlfriend have sex. You can't have a boyfriend have sex. That's immorality. Forget about those who commit adultery while married and married someone else, like my ex-wife. Their marriage is an abomination. It's of hell. May the Lord convict them to repent before it's too late. And I know it's hard for many of us, especially some of us who've gone through broken marriages, because we're afraid to get married a second time lest we make a mistake and end up in a divorce a second time. And yet we can't just date and have sex until we get married because that's a sin. See my point? I know the struggle, the battle is real. Hey, sucks being us. Right? But sexual pleasure pales in comparison if we carry our cross and deny our souls by the power of the Holy Spirit to what awaits us when we face the Lord and are flooded in His infinite love, joy, and peace that's beyond understanding that makes all these pleasures look like pain. So we have to endure. Here the stalker again. He's stalking me. Go to, can you get out of here, dude? Why are you stalking me, man? Okay. You with me there? So are you learning the point of revelation? The Lord is rebuking a church that is falling away into false teaching due to false teachers. And he's warning that church, be, be aware, repent, or I'm going to remove you. So Revelation 3 also teaches that if you refuse to remain in union with Christ, if you refuse to repent and turn to Christ, you'll be cut off, lose salvation, and severed from union with Christ. That was Revelation 2.21. Now let's read the rest of it. Now it gets a little juicier. Revelation 2.22 to 23. I want you to learn the faith, not just theology, but our responsibility. And pray for me to be a doer of the word. Now watch this. Revelation 2.22 to 23. Indeed, I will cast her, Jezebel, I will cast her in a sick bed. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, I will allow all hell to break loose on your life unless they repent of their deeds. Now here is what's beautiful. I will kill her children with death, right? Now watch this. I'm going to read 21 as well. I gave her, I gave Jezebel time to repent of her sexual morality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, I'll allow all hell to break loose unless they repent of their sins. I will kill her children, meaning spiritual children, not physical babies, those who follow her. And all the church shall know that I am he. Now, let me break down the implication. Number one, Jesus controls life and death from heaven. Notice he can kill you dead while he's in heaven. He can in, in, afflict you with a disease and a sickness and illness while in heaven. Or he can heal you from your disease and preserve you from dying while in heaven. And he can allow... All hell to break loose on your life while in heaven. So what does this tell you about Jesus? That from heaven, he controls life and death on earth so that he determines when you die, how you'll die, how long you'll live. And he has the power to afflict you with diseases, with illnesses, whether cancer, whether COVID. And he can allow all hell to break loose on your life. And he does that from heaven. God bless you, Jedediah. You can rewatch it later. Later, You get it? What more proof do you want that Jesus is the God-man? From heaven, he knows everything. From heaven, he's all-powerful over creation. From heaven, he controls life and death. From heaven, he can afflict you with disease, with illnesses, with sicknesses, with cancer, and allow all hell to break loose on your life. Or he can heal you, preserve you, and save you. You want me there? No, small Anna. If you have a woman doctor, choose a female gynecologist because you need to have your body checked. Now, are you with me there? But now I want you to see the heart of Jesus, though. Here's where you're going to see the heart of Jesus. This is why I wanted to break this. God's girl, everyone, are you learning? You're learning practical application, what our responsibility is? If we are truly Christians and if we fail to heed the Lord's rebuking, chastening, we'll be cut off. 
from union with him? Severed? Okay, now, notice he says in Revelation 2.21, I gave her time to repent. This shows you the heart of Jesus. The Lord is compassionate, merciful, loving, and patient, and he doesn't desire to destroy but to save even false teachers. Notice the Lord said, I gave her time to repent. I waited for her to repent. Showing that God's desire, Jesus' desire, was even for her to repent because he didn't want to destroy her. So this you see, the mercy of the Lord, the compassion of the Lord, the grace of the Lord, the patience of the Lord. <clears throat> you see all that exemplified in this statement. This also illustrates something else. The Lord doesn't rush in judgment, but waits patiently to convict you to repent. Even though he knows, you won't repent. If the Lord knows the end from the beginning, did he not know that Jezebel wouldn't repent, no matter how much he convicts her? Of course. Then why wait? In order to prove himself to us when he doesn't have to. He doesn't need to prove himself to us because we're nobody. But he wants you to trust him and know, I'm not a God who delights to destroy and punish and rush to judgment. I'm a God who is patient, <clears throat> slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and compassion. And I desire that the wicked repent and not be destroyed. So by waiting patiently and seeing with your own eyes, she won't repent. Now you'll know that when I punish her, she left me no choice. She deserved it because what more do you want me to do in drawing her to repentance? All I did, she defied me. She challenged me to my face. She became more hardened and stiff-necked, leaving my no choice but to punish. Do you see the Lord, why he does it? You see the wisdom. Look, I'm going to give her time to repent because I want her to live. I don't want her to die, but she won't repent. Look, look how many times I warn her. Look how many chances I give her. Look, every time I warn her and extend patience and mercy, she becomes more stiff-necked, more hardened, and opposes me even more so, <clears throat> leaving me no choice to, but to bring judgment. You see how much you're learning about the character of our Lord? And again, like someone said, this destroys Calvinism. These passages make no sense in light of Calvinism, this wicked, filthy, demonic doctrine that Jesus saved me from. And may the Lord save Anthony and James White from it or protect people from them and use us to silence and rebuke these false teachers and their false doctrines. So is, is that all clear? Do you learn so much about the character of Christ? Notice, not only do you learn that he's God Almighty in the flesh, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-sovereign, all-powerful, controls life and death, you learn how merciful, compassionate, loving, and patient he is, and you learn he wants even false teachers and the immoral to live by repenting, and you also learn what he expects of you. If you're my servants and you name me and I'm your Lord, then you must live a certain way. And there's a way in which you cannot follow. My servants cannot be sexually immoral. My servants cannot be idolatrous. My servants must be pure physically, emotionally, psychologically, <clears throat> and spiritually. So you're learning your responsibility as those who belong to Christ, that he desires obedience to his commands and his will, hate sin, shun sin, don't justify sin, call what God calls evil, evil, call what God calls good, good, and submit to our Lord. Is that clear? Did you get all that? Because I got to make sure you get all this meat before I venture into other passages. Now, honestly, be honest with me and up front. Are you learning a lot from these verses about the beautiful, glorious, majestic nature of our God? The magnificent, glorious beauty of Jesus and how clear the evidence is that he's God Almighty, Son of the Father, Companion of the Spirit, who's in the, who's in the flesh, and learning what Christ expects from you, how to live, how not to live. And 
Are you blown away with how much meat there is in these verses? Because if you just read them on a surface level, you're going to miss the meat and the depth. Who would have thought there would be this much meat in verses 18 to 23 of chapter 2? Is it sinking in? And I asked Holy Spirit to make my voice powerful and clear to your ears. Is that clear? So we've established from Revelation 2, 18 to 23, he is the God man, God in flesh, who is almighty over creation, who controls life and death, who knows everything perfectly. We establish that? All right. Okay, so we established that. Now let's go to 1 Kings 8, 39. 1 Kings 8, 39. Watch here. Watch here, guys. This is going to be only part one. Lord willing, part two, we're going to work through Mark from chapters 1 to 13, and then Matthew as well. Okay, 1 Kings 8, 39. Then here in heaven, your dwelling place, and forgive an act, and give to everyone according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. Did you catch it? God in heaven, he alone knows the desires, the thoughts of all the minds and the hearts of the sons of men, human beings on earth. And he alone from heaven forgives and will repay according to your actions or your requests, right? Is that clear? You see it? Who? Jehovah. Anyone else besides Jehovah in heaven? No, Jehovah. All right. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind, right? 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8. Keep what we just read in mind. He alone in heaven knows the hearts of all human beings on earth, and he hears their prayers and their requests and repays them accordingly, and he alone forgives sins. Keep that in mind, right? Keep that in mind. Now, 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8. Yep, hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8. So that you come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting, for the revelation, revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what it's saying is God has given you every spiritual gift you need to be whole and complete in his sight until he returns. And if you remain you, united to Christ and yield to the spirit, Jesus will then preserve you by his power, making you blameless before him so that when he comes, you don't have to fear his wrath. Who keeps you blameless? Jesus. So let me ask you a question. What power must Jesus have to be able to strengthen you and preserve you to remain holy, united to him, and blameless on the day he comes to judge? He's the one who confirms, strengthens you to the end. Your power to endure and overcome comes from him as long as you don't resist it, as long as you don't reject it. What kind of power must the Lord have to do that? See, it says, Jesus will confirm you, right, to the end. Father, Son, Spirit, blessed internet connection. Ya Allahi. Please, Lord. You got it, right? And so who's coming on that day to then judge? Who's coming on that day to judge? Sarah, are you still here? I hope you are. I hope you're learning. Who's coming? All right. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Because watch where we're going to go with this. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. And Lord willing, we're going to wrap up part one shortly, and then we're going to do part two. Don't worry. There's a lot more to come. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Watch here. Watch whose judgment seat. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So who's coming to judge? Jesus. Who will we stand before in judgment? Jesus. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So did you catch it? Jesus is coming, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus will reveal himself from heaven 
in his glorified physical body of flesh, where he comes to the world to judge the living and dead. And we will stand before Jesus and he will judge us for our deeds. You caught it, right? So Jesus, right? No doubt it's Jesus Christ, correct? Paul says it's Jesus, our Lord, who's coming on the day of Jesus Christ when he reveals himself from heaven, returning to the earth in his physical glorified body of flesh to judge. All right. And if you want corroborating evidence, support for it, John 5, 22. Who's coming to judge? John 5, 22. Watch here. Watch here, guys. So you're going to see why this is amazing. Yep, part of the Apostles' Creed coming from Scripture. John 5, 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. End of story. It is the Son, Jesus, who comes to judge, and the Father sends the Son to judge on behalf of the Godhead. Now, why is this important? 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 5. Now that we've established it, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 5. First Corinthians chapter four, verses three to five. Watch here. This, I hope it blows you away. I don't know if it will, but watch. First Corinthians four, three to five. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. Now this has meat. So guys, please don't let Satan distract you. This has meat. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. And Paul already told you that Lord is Jesus Christ. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. And who's the Lord who's coming? Jesus Christ. Who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Now, verse 5 should blow you away. Okay, it says when the Lord comes, who's Jesus Christ, he will reveal this things done in secret, in dark places, and then will expose the inclinations and the counsels of the hearts of all men. Now, wait, we just read in first Kings 8 39. God alone knows the hearts of the sons of men. But then here we're told. The Lord Jesus is coming in the day of Jesus Christ when Jesus will reveal himself from heaven, his glorified physical body of flesh, sitting on his judgment seat, judging everyone because he's the one who's coming, the son, to judge. And here Jesus will expose everything hidden in secret dark places. He will make it manifest and he will then reveal your inclinations, your motives, your desires. What kind of attributes must Jesus possess to reveal the desire, inclination, motive of every creature who's ever lived? What kind of attributes must Jesus have to be able to unveil, reveal, show everything done in dark, secret, remote places, hidden before the sight of others? What kind of attributes? Tell me, what kind of knowledge must he have in power? So is it clear that the Bible depicts Jesus as the infinitely wise, infinitely knowledgeable, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-sovereign God in the flesh? But now... What, what do I like about 1 Corinthians 4, 3 to 5? Did you see what Paul said in 3 and 4? Let me repeat. Let me explain what he's saying here. 1 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Right here. Look what he says here. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. Now, let me explain what he means. Understand Paul's heart. May the Lord Jesus make us like Paul and fill us with the Holy Spirit as he filled Paul, who tried to love Jesus, not for the praise of men, but for the glory of Christ. May we all be like him, men and women. 
Now, you know what he's saying here, guys? Please understand what he's saying. He goes, you know what? I could care less if you judge me. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or are you in court. In other words, I could give a damn what you think of me. I could give a damn of your opinion of me and your judgment of me. Antonia, I could give a damn what Anthony and Jimmy White and Volcap thinks of me. I could give a damn of what these fake Christians who think they're pious and spiritual, humble, and more Christ-like than me say of me and their judgment of me. I could care less what the corrupt legal system, this corrupt wicked judge did to me in my marriage. That doesn't matter to me because your opinion and what you say and do to me means nothing to me. See what Paul is saying? You see his attitude? I could give a damn what Razzles thinks of me. I could give two cents what Protestant says of me, what Mrs. Kelly Powers, Austin Powers' wife, is saying of me and trying to make sessions, slandering me so he can get more viewers because I live in his head. I own him. He exists for me. I don't care what they say. I don't care of how you judge me because your judgment means nothing. But then he says something else. He says something else. I don't even judge myself. Now, why is that amazing? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 4.4 4 again. 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Here's what's amazing. This is something mind-blowing. Pay attention to what he says. Okay? 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, brother. Post it again. Watch here. This is what why Paul is my hero, and I pray I can be like him. Not for your praise, the praise of men, but for the glory of Christ. For I know of nothing against me, yet I'm not justified by this, but he judges me as the Lord. Now, what he means by this is, I don't even judge myself. You know why? Because I can be self-deceived. Please, guys, hear me. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit. What he's saying is, I don't judge myself. You know why? Because I may be self-deceived. I may be judging myself in a manner where I'm deceiving myself and thinking I'm above reproach, that I'm not a heretic, and I'm not in sin. See, this is the scary thing of being self-deluded and self-deceived. See, I think I'm on the path of truth, and that Anthony is the tool of the devil, filled of the devil, which is why he's manifesting. Same with Jim, Jim, Jimmy Muhammad. But they think out of me. So you know what Paul is saying? I'm not aware of anything that I've done that makes me blameworthy. As far as I know, I'm not aware of any sin in my life that makes me blameworthy because I confess of my sins and ask the Spirit to help me to repent, nor am I aware of any teaching that I hold that's wrong that would condemn me. However, my self-assessment, my self-judgment doesn't mean I'm acquitted because I can be judging myself falsely, judging myself <clears throat> incorrectly. I may be self-deluded, self-deceived. So at the end of the day, even my own judgment of myself, my own view of myself means nothing. It's what Jesus says about me that matters. It's his judgment of me that counts, not what I think of myself. See what he's saying? You understand what he just said? Because all of us here think that we are on the path of truth. All of us think that we are true believers. All of us think we have the true doctrines. All of us think we belong to the true church and the other guy is wrong. So the Catholics think the Orthodox church is not completely true. Orthodox thinks, no, the Catholic church is not completely true. That's what we all think about ourselves and our churches and what we think of the other. But Paul says, you may be self-deluded, self-deceived. And your opinion and self-assessment doesn't matter. It's Jesus' assessment of you and his judgment that matters. So let's be a little humble. Let's, little be, let's be a little gracious. Let's be a little more patient and tolerant. And let's not rush to judging one another until the day the Lord, when he will make perfect judgment of all of us. That's Paul's point. Isn't that humbling? Isn't that humbling? 
Isn't that amazing? Honestly, guys, can you tell me, are you not blown away with the depth of Scripture, the beauty of Scripture, the meat of Scripture, how miraculous and supernatural this book is? It's truly of the Lord. Honestly, don't just say it to appease me. Isn't it not mind-blowing that this, the Bible itself is a living miracle that the God of the Bible exists because that's his voice. And look at the men he chose to give us his word. Isn't that amazing? And convicting and moving and life transforming and humbling. Okay, now final one for today. And we're going to wrap up part one. And then we're going to do part two, Lord willing, in the upcoming days. If not tomorrow, because there's a lot of topics for me to discuss. But make sure you hit the like button. Make sure these sessions go viral, folks. Please help me to help you. All right. Final one, Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. But let's look at Luke 10, 22, the Luke inversion. Luke 10, 22. While on earth, Jesus on earth. Luke 10, 22. He's still on earth. Look what he says. Luke 10, 22. Okay, watch here. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. Now watch, you guys. Please watch because we're going to wrap it up. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. An astonishing assertion. Number one, Jesus is not the Father. And notice he's on earth before he died on the cross. Number two, Jesus says he's the unique son who knows the father to the same extent that the father knows him, which is why he's the only man qualified to perfectly make the father known. You understand? Look what he says. All things have been committed, committed to me by my father. No one knows who the son is except the father and who the father is except the son. Now, let me explain what that means. God the father is an incomprehensible divine person. He's beyond comprehension, and no one can fully fathom him except the Son. Notice this. No one knows who the Father is except the Son. If the Son is a mere creature, if the Son is a mere creature, how can he, a mere creature, say, no one knows the Father except the Son when the Father is an incomprehensible divine person beyond our ability to fully comprehend, but Jesus says, I know and comprehend him perfectly, which is why I alone among men can perfectly reveal him. Who does Jesus think he is? When you say Holy Spirit, yeah, the Holy Spirit knows the Father. That's what I mean. He's not excluding the Spirit. He's talking about men. And how do I know Christ is king? That he's not excluding the Spirit? Because of Luke 10, 21. Let's see that the Holy Spirit is united to Christ and knowing and comprehending the Father. But he's talking about human beings, and Jesus is a man on earth, and he's now a man in heaven. Luke 10, 21. Look, so it's not, he's not saying not even the Spirit knows. No, the Son is always working with the Spirit in union with the Spirit. He's talking about no one, meaning no man, because Jesus is a man, but he's more than a man. Here it is, Luke 10, 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. So you see that, Christ is King? The Son is always working with the Spirit, in union with the Spirit. The Spirit is always working in union with the, with the Son. They're always working together inseparably perfectly. So he's not including the Spirit as someone who doesn't know. It's not about no one, meaning no human. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and reveal them to babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. So now, watch the point. No human being knows the Father completely exhaustively because the Father is an incomprehensible divine person. If Jesus is a mere human being and he's a creature, how then can he say no one knows the Father except the Son, which is why he can go on to say, and to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Since I, the Son, alone comprehend the Father perfectly, I alone am qualified to make himself known to anyone truly and accurately. Who does Jesus think he is? Does that sound like even before his death, 
while on earth that Jesus was not omniscient? Or does Jesus sound like he is the omniscient son who, because he's omniscient, knows the Father truly and completely? What does that sound like? Now, remember, this is before his death. He's on earth. What does that sound like? Help me out, guys. Go and wrap it up. Waiting. This is why I'm going to some people. I'm waiting because, guys, this class session is I'm waiting for feedback. Okay. But then I don't know if you paid attention to the first part. The first part. He says, no one knows who the son is except the father. Who does Jesus think he is? Notice it's reciprocal. No one knows who the son is. No one knows who the father is. Okay, well, I understand. No one can truly know the father completely exhaustively because he's incomprehensible. But Jesus, who do you think you are by saying no one knows you as well? No one knows the son except the father. And no one knows the father except the son. This is reciprocal. Just like no one is able to know the Father completely, no one can know the Son completely. Why? Why would the Son say, like the Father, no one can know the Son the way they're unable to know the Father? Unless the Son, like the Father, is an incomprehensible person, an incomprehensible divine person that requires an omniscient mind to truly know fully and completely which is why only the Father can truly know the Son, because the Father is omniscient. And being omniscient, having an omniscient mind that he shares in union with the Son and the Spirit, the Father can know the Son as he is truly and completely, something beyond the grasp of any creature. So you see that in this statement, Jesus claims to be the incomprehensible, omniscient Son who knows the Father the same way the Father knows him, who is just as uh, incomprehensible as the Father is, which is why only an omniscient mind can know the Son, just like only an omniscient mind can know the Father truly. So it shows the essential equality of the Father and Son, that these two persons are incomprehensible and omniscient because they possess the same omniscient mind. Is that clear? Is that clear, guys? Now, let me give you the Matthean parable because I want to destroy Jimmy Muhammad White's and Anthony Diocletian Rogers' wicked, filthy, satanic doctrine of Tulip. Bury that demonic doctrine and muzzle these Bible butchers for the glory of Jesus. Now, you'll see why. Now, let's see the Matthean parable because this same statement is found in Matthew. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Watch here. Watch here. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Same saying, but found in Matthew. You're going to see why I'm using this. Because I'm going to tell you what this wicked Bible pervert Anthony Rogers did in a session a couple weeks ago on gospel truth when he was asked to talk about Calvinism. And sadly, I used to butcher this text the way he did. But first, let me, let's read it. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. Well, wait. Why... <clears throat> Are human beings incapable of knowing you, Jesus? Because I, the Son, happen to be incomprehensible, making it impossible for mere human creatures to fully comprehend me, which is why the Father alone can know me truly, because the Father has an omniscient mind. So only an omniscient mind can know me truly. But similarly and reciprocally, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. Hold on, Jesus. If no mere human creature can truly know the Father completely because the Father is incomprehensible, how can you know the Father the same way the Father knows you? The Father knows you inside and out and knows everything about you, and you know the Father inside and out and everything about Him because it's reciprocal. If you're a creature and you're not omniscient, well, I'm not a creature and I am omniscient, which is why I alone am able to reveal God to man and the one to whom the son wills to reveal him. So here's my question. If the son knows the father 
In the same way the Father knows him. And if the Son knows the Father inside and out, exhaustively and completely in every aspect of the Father, the same way the Father knows the Son inside and out, exhaustively and completely in every aspect of the Son, does the Father know every thought the Son has? Does he know all the wisdom that the Son possesses? All the knowledge, all the information that the Son possesses? Does he? So if the Son then knows the Father, the same way the Father knows the Son, doesn't this mean that the Son knows every thought the Father possesses? All the knowledge and information and wisdom the Father possesses? Because he knows the Father the way the Father knows him? So does the Son, son know every thought, every idea, all the information, wisdom, understanding that the Father possesses? Yeah? You getting it? Well, hold on. Isn't the knowledge of the day or hour one of those thoughts, part of the information that the Father knows? Isn't the knowledge of the day or hour one of the thoughts a part of the information that the Father knows? Yeah. So if the Son knows the Father inside and out, exhaustively like the Father knows the Son, and the Son knows all the thoughts of the Father and all the information of the Father, doesn't this mean that the Son must necessarily know that bit of information that the Father knows about the dare hour? See where I went with this? See where I went with this? You see where I went with this, right? So there you go. So you got it, right? Okay, now. Why then does the same Matthew, Matthew 24, 36... Why, body podcast? If you have any objections, I'll be more than happy to destroy you for the glory of Jesus. So if you want to call me so I can muzzle it would be my pleasure. Skype me. Say Matthew, Matthew 24, 36, Jesus says, Of the day hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven, but the Father alone. You see what I meant when I said earlier? Let's see if you're paying attention. Never interpret a verse that's found in the middle or near the end of the book in isolation from all the chapters that came before it. So if someone was reading Matthew 11 before they got to Matthew 24, 36, they would have seen this paradox of Jesus knowing everything the Father knows and yet saying only the Father knows the day and hour. No, Gochi, you may not call me because I'm blocking you. Get out of here. Get out of here, dude. Take a hike because you couldn't shut your mouth. I don't want to deal with you. Okay, kept telling you shut up, but you got to keep barking. Get out of here. I don't want people like you here. You're a distraction. Go find another channel. Okay, now, how do we reconcile that Jesus is omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful, equal to the Father in essence, nature, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, but claims that he as the Son does not know the dare, dare hour. That's coming. But one thing you learn in this session, it's not either or. Both facts are taught in Scripture. It's not either or. It's not either he knows or he doesn't. The Bible teaches both. Jesus is the omniscient Lord, the Almighty Lord, Jehovah in the flesh, who knows everything, who's equal to the Father in the Father's wisdom, knowledge, understanding, who knows everything about the Father to the same extent that the Father knows about him, which is why he alone is qualified to make God known in union with the Spirit, because he's always in union with the Spirit, not to the exclusion of the Spirit. And yet he can say that as the Son, the day or hour he does not know. In other words, this is why the church was forced to accept all of what the Bible teaches 
and was forced to admit Jesus is God Almighty, who's omniscient. But as a man, being truly human, while on earth, he experienced genuine human limitations. So they didn't say it's either this or that. It's both and. Because the Bible doesn't tell us how to reconcile these statements. The Bible simply gives us the data. This is true. This is true. But it doesn't explain how both can be true. These are facts that the authors of Scripture experience as a living reality. And they simply communicated those facts and preserved them in writing for us to learn what they experienced. But they didn't harmonize them for us. You see my point? They didn't harmonize them for us. Now let's go out with a bang. Okay, I didn't know. All right, I'm sorry, Body Podcast. I thought you're a troll, a Trinitarian troll, seeking to attack the Trinity, which I don't mind because I will I love to destroy blasphemies and blasphemers for the glory of Jesus. Body Podcast, I don't know. Do you want to ask me about adultery now? That's not the topic. Okay, now, let me show you why God is exposing Anthony like he did James White. Folks, I'm sorry to say this. I didn't want to say this, and don't be upset with me because he's now on a jihad, him and his fanboys and his lovers, to try to attack my character because they can't refute me. And it's going to get worse for Anthony. We're going to destroy his lies and blasphemies and send him packing. He's already discredited himself. The Lord is rebuking. May God save us from being rebuked and chastened for our sins. May the Lord have mercy and continue to guide us to yield to his truth and affirm that truth and admit when we're wrong and repent of our sins. And if Anthony keeps hardening himself, he'll be worse than James White. And the Lord will deal with them in Jesus' name. And we'll be here to muzzle them. This Bible butcher, to his shame, quoted Matthew eleven twenty-seven 27 to prove Calvinism. That God already predestines who will know Christ. He used Matthew eleven twenty-seven, 27. And sadly, I used to use it too until God gave me the grace to repent. He misquoted Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 to show, see, Calvin was true. God has already foreordained. He's already determined beforehand those whom Christ will reveal God to. Okay? Now let me bury his lie and expose this wicked, filthy Bible butcher. See, Calvinists will stop at Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27. But let me read it in context for you. First, let's look at Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Here's what they don't do because they are tools of the devil. Guys, I'm being honest. Thank Jesus he saved me from Tulip. Tulip is a doctrine of the devil. It blasphemes Jesus, though there are good men who sadly hold to it because they've been deceived into thinking it's true. May God have mercy on them. But folks like Anthony, may God crush their mouths and expose them. You vile dog, I'm coming after you. So you can send your brother to do your dirty work and beat me. Ooh, I scared. All right, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Watch here, guys. It's okay, God's girl. God exposed them. To be honest, I never took Anthony. Good, God's girl, because the spirit was saving you from this wicked, filthy, vile dog. No disrespect to dogs. He's worse than James White. All things have been delivered to me by my father, and no one knows the son except the father, nor does anyone know the father except the son, and the one to whom the son wills to reveal him. Aha, end of story. God chooses beforehand who the Son will reveal God to. And he only does it for the elect. Ha, 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 ha. We got you. You want me to now bury this Bible butcher and shame and humiliate him? Because he had it coming. Because he's now hardening his heart and stiffening his neck. You want me to show you why this doesn't prove Calvinism? You guys ready? So we can go out with a bang? You ready? After Jesus just said, it is the son who decides who will know God. The son decides to whom he'll reveal God to, right? But now read 28 to 30. Look at what these filthy, wicked Bible butchers do to scripture. Why don't you read 28 to 30, Antonia, Nero, <clears throat> Rogers, you filthy, vile, 
tool of the devil. You're no better than your Roman ancestors who persecuted true believers and killed them. Now watch what Jesus goes on to say. Come to me, all you who labor and are heaven heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see what he didn't quote? Right after saying, it is up to me to make God known, Jesus now says, and I want all of you to know God. All of you are tired and weary. I want all of you to come to me because my desire is to make God known to all of you who are tired and weary. Why didn't he quote the rest of it? Come to me, all you who labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why do you think this wicked, filthy Bible butcher didn't quote 28 to 30 and just stopped at 27? Because Jesus goes on to show you all those that he wants to make God known. And he just told you, my desire is that everyone who's tired, everyone who's burdened with life's problems will come to me because I want all of you to know my father and know me and all of you who are tired to come to me so I can give you everlasting rest. Why didn't he quote the rest of it? Thank Jesus he saved me, folks. I have to be honest. I, too, used to butcher scriptures this way to make it agree with Calvinism. But the Spirit kept convicting me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. All glory to you. Give us the power to love you and worship you, adore you, and cling to you, and save us and own us completely, to never shame you or fall in sin. The Spirit kept convicting me. Wouldn't leave me at rest until I saw and I repented. But with Anthony, this wicked, filthy, vile Bible butcher, the more he gets corrected, the more proud and arrogant and vile and demonic he becomes because God is going to make him look stupid. <laughs> Folks, though he did great work on the Trinity, Anthony is not a credible, humble servant. He's no better than James White. Watch what God's going to do to these Bible butchers. But now let us be humble. Let us be fearful. And let's pray and beg the Holy Spirit not to give us what we deserve and allow us to fall like them, but save us from ourselves and Satan and keep in love with Jesus. So this ends part one. Was that clear? Did you learn a lot? Did you feast tremendously on the meat of scripture? If so, please, I need your prayers more than ever. They're coming after me because they want to discredit me. Cry out, pray, have others pray and fast for my daughters and I. Ask the Lord for divine, miraculous, physical, health, safety, protection for my daughters and myself and their mother. That God will have mercy on her. Folks, I say this, not try to be a saint. My heart hurts for my ex-wife because I can tell you she's more miserable and depressed because of what she's done. It hurts me to see that this young woman... All her life was trying to find love, but because she tried to find it in all the wrong places and wouldn't just submit to Christ and allow Christ to flood her in his love and rest, she kept making one bad choice after another, adding more destruction, bringing more chaos and misery, and making herself more miserable and sad and depressed in the long run. It hurts me because she's the mother of my kids, and she is a creature that Jesus created out of his love, who wants her to be saved. So pray God will save her. Pray God will destroy that wicked, adulterous marriage, put a fire in her heart to let this man go, and just remain celibate for the Lord. Because sadly, this is biblical, guys. Sadly, once you've committed adultery and you destroyed a marriage in adultery, you can never be validly married. Christians, let me say this again. I want you to understand this. If you have committed adultery by leaving your spouse and you wedded to another, you are in adultery. Your marriage will never be accepted by the Lord. And no other marriage afterwards will ever be accepted by God. That means my ex-wife can never be ever validly married again. And all her unions will be an abomination of the devil in the sight of God. Ask the Lord to give her the grace of purity to remain celibate and just give her life to Christ. 
Ask the Lord to protect my daughters from Martin. He doesn't believe in God. He's a heathen. He's a spiritual dog as well. Doesn't know the Lord. Doesn't know the Bible. Barely speaks English. Went through a bad divorce. I don't want that influence in my daughter's life. Pray God will save them from him. Bring them to me. I can be with them every day. And ask the Lord for miraculous protection that I never fall into any scandal. Never fall into any sexual scandal or financial scandal. To love the Lord by my deeds. That the Lord will heal me of my lustful desires and passions. And my shortcomings. And to finish the race with integrity, with power, with boldness, without compromise. And to be more loving and patient. And do pray for the support that it doesn't decrease, but it remains steady so I can take care of my daughters and pay the bills to do the work of the Lord. Though he doesn't need me, I need him. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, Abba have mercy, Son of God have mercy, Holy Spirit have mercy. Purify us, cleanse us, wash us, our loved ones, my daughters, and Michelle, their mother, in the blood of Jesus. Fill them, fill us with the Holy Spirit to love you Faithfully in holiness unto the end. Help us to die to our flesh and hate Satan and never shame you until Jesus comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Maranatha. Lord willing, part two sometime this week. I hope you're blessed and blown away and you learned a lot. And thank you for being my family. And thank you for allowing me to be open with you and honest and transparent without you condemning me. Pray God give me self-control to keep the weight off, to get healthier, keep exercising. So I never stumble into food addiction. And that same will never use my health against me. And love the Lord more than I love anything in this world. Take care, guys.